Welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast on planet Earth that selects a theme for each season and then pick six movies to be part of that season's theme. After that, each episode of that season features one of those movies. It starts off with some history on how and why the movie got made, then you get a full review of the movie from start to finish to see if it's any good. Jokes are cracked. Shade is thrown. Snarks a plenty. The show's hosts are none other than me, Chad Cooper, and my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell. This is season 22, and the theme is Deja Ew, featuring a half dozen remakes of famous horror movie franchise from the back end of the last century. And because we here at Pick 6 Movies think that Christmas has gotten a little too full of itself, having the audacity to show up on store shelves with brightly lit Christmas trees, yuletide decorations, and holiday cheer in the middle of October, haha, we made the decision to drop a heap and help in a Halloween right in the middle of the Christmas season. That's right, take that Christmas with your peace on earth and your goodwill toward men. Pick 6 Movies wants to ask you, Christmas, how does it feel to have Rob Zombie's misguided remake of John Carpenter's classic halloween theme movie, Halloween, crash your holiday party? It's not so holly or jolly, is it, Christmas? Thanksgiving, you stay out of this. This doesn't concern you. Ah, I think we need to bring the temperature of this conversation down a few degrees, and there's one voice of reason who can always de-escalate a conflict better than anybody I know, and that's Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, get in here and tell us all about the movie that's all about your favorite holiday, Halloween. Hey there, Garrett. Yeah, yeah, I usually do the work from home thing with these intros, but uh, I listen to the ones that you've been doing with Chad this season, and, and, you know, I thought we ought to have a sit down. Nope, nope, don't bother coming out of the booth. You look like you might have an aroma. But uh, I thought we could talk about one of the great horror films of all time and, you know, have a little fun. And to kick things off, let me ask you this. What is your favorite horror movie? Gates of Hell, huh? Uh, I, I love Fulci and... Who doesn't like seeing someone vomit up their own intestines? Uh, Mine would be The Thing. You know, the John Carpenter version, of course. The top five Carpenter movies. That is a doozy. Well, uh, The Thing is a lock at number one. uh, Then in no particular order. uh, They Live, Big Trouble in Little China, Escape from New York, and Halloween. Yeah, Halloween is terrific. And interesting because it's by no means the first slasher movie. You had Black Christmas well before Halloween to set up some of those tropes. And not the first to use POV shots either. You had some of that in Peeping Tom. But it was the first to make all of that feel palatable. And not just palatable, essential. For years, Halloween was the most successful independently produced film of all time. What? Yeah, yeah, I know you know that, Garrett, but I'm talking to the listeners now. We're shifting it into intro time. Keep up. And while we're at it, lay down some of that John Carpenter appropriate music. Ah, that's the stuff. All right, so we've talked before about John Carpenter way back in Season 3, Episode 4, but it's worth diving deep on this one particular movie. If you'll recall, John Carpenter was a graduate of the University of Southern California Film School. As a fan of old directors, especially Howard Hawks, Carpenter differed from other contemporaries of USC, like George Lucas and John Milius, who had a more auteur vision of filmmaking. Carpenter was the kind of guy who brought your movie in under budget and on schedule, and added his own flair where he could. It was Erwin Yablins who brought the idea for Halloween to Carpenter. Yablins had a new production company, Compass Pictures, and decided he was going to make a horror movie about babysitters being stalked by a killer. Carpenter agreed to the project with one condition. He had full creative control. For that, he would make the movie for $300,000, Carpenter would get $10,000 and 10% of the profits, and as long as he stuck to the 20-day schedule, he'd get final cut too. Also, Carpenter would get name above the title, just like Howard Hawks. Yablins was a fan of Carpenter's earlier film, Assault on Precinct 13. 
he thought that this mustachio director, who would also score the film, uh, was a talented guy that could save him a few bucks. And so, Carpenter and his girlfriend and producer, Deborah Hill, set about writing the script. Deborah Hill set the film in Haddonfield, a stand-in for her hometown of Haddonfield, New Jersey. This Haddonfield would be in Illinois, but what the two had in common was a small-town feeling, an innocence. This was the sort of town with a handful of cops because bad things just didn't happen in Haddonfield. This was a safe place, at least until Hill and Carpenter got their hands on it. Yablins was the one who decided to set the film on Halloween, and Carpenter added the heroine. Lori Strode, the part that would be made famous by Jamie Lee Curtis, was based on the heroines of the epics Carpenter loved, mostly westerns, and given his relationship and shared ethos with Deborah Hill, Lori would not be a mere victim. She would be a fighter, a woman who held her own against the boogeyman of Haddonfield. It was Hill, too, that recommended Jamie Lee Curtis for the role, suggesting she had the same sort of innocence as Lori. Hollywood had not yet made Curtis jaded, and she had an intensity, a quietude that Hill liked. With Curtis brought in to add some depth and complexity to the character, it was now time to fill out the rest of the cast. For Dr. Loomis, the Ahab to the White Whale of Michael Myers, and yes, Garrett, I know I'm making an oblique reference to Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, but some of these are just for us, Garrett. Keep it down. Where was I? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, Dr. Loomis was going to be filled by veteran British horror actors Peter Cushing or Christopher Lee, who both passed on the project. Lee later said it was one of the bigger mistakes of his career. And as has been noted on this show before, Christopher Lee rules. Anyways, Erwin Yoblin suggested another British actor, Donald Pleasance. Pleasance was quiet about the movie and his involvement with it when it wrapped filming, but he would later grow more effusive in his praise of the film and Carpenter, with whom he would work in more movies including Escape from New York and Prince of Darkness. And it's kind of funny how success makes you a fan of the movie you were in, I suppose. PJ Souls as Linda and Nancy Keys as Annie fill in the gaps as Laurie's more sexed up friends. And while Carpenter says he had no intention to make the sexuality of the characters be some kind of litmus test for survival, that's sort of how it worked out. Famed film critic Pauline Kael may have been the first to make the association between characters having sex and dying for it, and the quote, virginal strength of Laurie as the final girl. Just another way in which Carpenter was casually revolutionary. Nick Castle, a film school pal of Carpenter's, was roped into playing The Shape, a.k.a. Michael Myers, when he stopped by the set to watch his pal make the movie. As for the iconic mask, well, as you know, Garrett, it's just a William Shatner mask. The eyes cut to be more open, and the face painted white to give it more of an ethereal look. The effect is, of course, haunting. Our villain was almost saddled with a plain clown mask instead, but a comparison between the clown mask and the altered Shatner mask led to a no-brainer of a decision, and it never looked better than it did in the original film. While filming, cinematographer Dean Cundy and John Carpenter came up with the POV shot at the beginning. This was achieved through a new device called the Steadicam, and Carpenter was eager to give the thing a spin, looking for an opportunity to do the kind of long tracking shot he admired from movies like Touch of Evil. Cundy was all in, and he and Carpenter would work together to achieve some great-looking visuals in movies like Big Trouble in Little China and The Thing. Oh, and Cundy also lends such movies as Back to the Future, Jurassic Park, and Apollo 13. Maybe you've heard of them? Dean Cundy is truly one of the best to ever shoot a movie, and his talent is on full display in Halloween, just as it is in his later masterpieces. Carpenter loved working with Cundy too, and the pair used a lot of simple tricks like starting with wide shots and gradually tightening between edits to draw the viewer in. As Carpenter admits, they had a pretty slim plot, so you had to do something to keep the audience hooked. And, like the camera work, a movie like this needed a good score. Carpenter said that he never really thought about the music while he was making Halloween, but Deborah Hill suggested that there might be a wee bit of bullshit in that. When he first screened the movie for his producers, though, it had none of the now-classic soundtrack, and Carpenter says he realized he had to save his movie with the music. So he holed up in a sound studio for a couple of weeks, but the main theme was a piece of music Carpenter had in his pocket for a while, a riff in 5-4 time that had no place to go until he tried it against the visuals in Halloween. 
John Carpenter is really modest about his composing and says he just likes simple riffs, but now he tours with his son playing that simple music to sold out crowds. Damn right, Garrett, it is pretty awesome. Anyways, once the movie was done, it was time to put it on the road. Being an indie film, there weren't a thousand prints to send to theaters all over, so the small number of prints would travel town to town. The premiere of the movie was on October 25th, 1978, in the metropolis of Kansas City, Missouri. As it toured, the movie gained notoriety mostly through word of mouth. In fact, Carpenter was directing the TV movie Elvis when he learned the movie was, you know, a success. By the way, that Elvis TV movie is pretty good, and it's the first time John Carpenter worked with Kurt Russell. And this one's for you, Garrett, and not the listeners. It's okay to watch a movie that isn't a horror movie, just like it's okay to eat a food that isn't a carb or wash with something that isn't an old fish. Just a heads up. Anyways, not only was Halloween getting some traction thanks to having a reputation as a great date movie, critics were starting to come around too. Pick Six preferred and dead as Judith Myers film critic Roger Ebert called it, quote, an absolutely merciless thriller. The movie spread like wildfire until it raked in $40 million on its first run. That's about $200 million in today's money, and on an initial investment of $320,000, that's not too shabby. Halloween was inducted into the Library of Congress in 2006, marking it as a legitimate film of historical note, and not just some cheap slasher. Or, as Carpenter put it, it was, quote, a bunch of kids making a movie. Either way, it has become revered. So much so that someone was bound to remake it at some point, except that's not how the remake in our season of remakes began. After the eighth Halloween movie, and can you believe they made eight of these? Halloween Resurrection, for those keeping score, by the way, and I know you are, Garrett. I know you're watching. There was a feeling that the franchise may have run out of steam, and so the question was, how do you breathe some new life into the old mask? Well, it just so happens that in 2003, some folks were thinking this same thing about Friday the 13th and A Nightmare on Elm Street. What they came up with was Freddy vs. Jason, And that movie proved to be a big hit. So much so that Mustafa Akkad, producer and rights holder of the Halloween franchise, started to sniff around for a crossover that might do the same for Myers et al. Stick with me here because if the following would have happened, it truly would have been one of the strangest films ever made. According to Pinhead himself, Doug Bradley, there was talk of a Halloween and Hellraiser crossover to be written by Clive Barker and directed by John Carpenter. The story would be that Michael Myers opened the Lament configuration, you know, the box from the Hellraiser movies, and was possessed by Samhain, the evil spirit of Halloween that gave Myers his invincibility. Then he would be pursued by the Cenobites. Barker envisioned Michael Myers as, quote, a sadomasochistic sexual pervert and serial killer, which would be enough to pique Pinhead's interest. When an online poll was introduced to wave viewer interest, almost everyone polled said this was a terrible idea, and once more, the internet gets something completely wrong. This is why Snakes on a Plane happens, and a Hellraiser v. Halloween does not. Stupid internet. So, it was back to the drawing board. There were proposed sequels like Halloween Retribution, which would bring back Busta Rhymes, who is actually in a Halloween movie, and one called Halloween Asylum, which would have followed Michael Myers escaping from Death Row, and then there was a prequel that would address where Michael Myers was when Halloween 3 Season of the Witch was happening, as if anyone could possibly care about that, and then tragedy struck. In 2005, Mustafa Akkad was killed in the Amman bombings while he was in Jordan attending a wedding. A legend of producing, and the guy who owned the rights to Halloween, was gone. Rights to the Halloween franchise passed on to Mustafa's son, Malik, and the new owner of Michael Myers and a real mess of a franchise proposed a new vision. Out with the old and in with the new. Sort of. Musician Rob Zombie made no bones about being a horror movie fan. His music was inspired by the horror films he loved as a youth, and in 1985, he formed White Zombie, the band that would make him famous. They had some big hits with songs like Dragula and... Thunder Kiss 65, and were contemporaries of bands like Pantera and Anthrax. 
The band broke up in the late 90s, and Rob Zombie went on to do a solo album called Hellbilly Deluxe around the same time. But success afforded Zombie the opportunity to throw his hat in the cinematic ring, and in the year 2000, Rob Zombie's first movie was released. House of a Thousand Corpses is part Texas Chainsaw Massacre, part The Hills Have Eyes, and very, very Rob Zombie. Universal was set to release the movie, and Zombie had made it clear that the film that he was making was very niche, not something meant for mainstream viewers. And yet, big studios, being big studios, saw what Rob Zombie had wrought and promptly shelved the movie. <laughs> what is this? Put it on the shelf. For over two years, Rob Zombie hunted for a distributor for his nasty little opus, and finally got the weirdos at Lionsgate, the same people releasing those Saw movies, to roll the dice on House of a Thousand Corpses. That movie is not necessarily good, but it is unique in its cribbing of classic horror movies into something very hellbilly, and so Rob Zombie became, despite universal shelving and a general pounding from critics, a filmmaker of note in the horror community. And shut up, Garrett, I'm getting to Devil's Rejects. In 2005, Rob Zombie released The Devil's Rejects, which is generally considered his best movie. Although, I would encourage you to look at a little movie called Lords of Salem, but enough about me. The Devil's Rejects is a direct sequel to House of a Thousand Corpses, and it was more favorably reviewed owing to its style and nihilistic take on its characters. It's a rough watch, but there are undeniable moments of cinematic achievement. Still, Zombie was a director and a writer of a particular style vulgar, often tasteless, a movie maker with both fists raised to give twin birds to the world. And this bravado was what brought him to the attention of Malik Akkad. It was a natural fit, a floundering franchise like Halloween, and an up-and-coming take-no-prisoners filmmaker like Rob Zombie, who clearly had a reverence for the material, and so Rob Zombie went to work making his own version of Halloween at the behest of Malik Akkad. But first, he had a phone call to make. When he asked for John Carpenter's blessing, Carpenter, ever of the cynic, told Zombie to make it his own. Don't worry about the iconic nature of the film, do your own thing, he said, and then he cashed a big check. And so Rob Zombie did just that, he made his own thing. Later, John Carpenter would criticize the resulting film for demystifying Michael Myers, but even now Zombie and Carpenter seem to be on pretty good terms. Zombie wanted to explore the reason why a Michael Myers might exist, to ground it in reality. In doing so, he leaned on the kind of writing he was known for. Vulgar, face-spitting, angry, and suggestive of a moral rod that runs through Zombie's movies. Myers would not be a pure boogeyman, he would be a psychopath, and we would see how a psychopath was born. Likewise, Loomis would be more opportunistic than the exposition dump of a character that he is in the first film, and Laurie would not be quite so pure. And so Zombie had his new vision, and the film went into production. The cast is made of some horror mainstays and cameo roles from Sid Haig, who also appears in House of a Thousand Corpses, and Dee Wallace from Cujo and the Howling, Ken Foree from George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, Clint Howard from Clint Howard, and some up-and-comer actors like Scout Taylor Compton as Laurie or Daniel Harris as Annie. Catherine Kebble as Linda is an interesting actor who has really made her name in video game voice work, a job for which I am available. So Halloween comes out, and it's a giant hit. In fact, it wasn't until the recent Marvel movie Shang-Chi that it was surpassed for the biggest opening weekend on a Labor Day. Can you believe that? Anyway, it wasn't much of a critical hit, not that that matters. Some praised it for trying something different, others said it lacked tension and the characters were interchangeable, but at the end of the day, it made money, and so a sequel was going to happen. Unfortunately, Rob Zombie wasn't really in a make a sequel kind of place, but the studio made it clear a sequel was going to happen with or without Rob Zombie. And yet, Rob Zombie made the movie, and it's one of the strangest sequels in movie history. But that, dear listeners, is a story for another time. This is the time to drag in the Loomis to my Michael and stalk this redneckified remake until it lies bloody at our feet. Ladies and gentlemen, Lori's and Ben Tramers, it's 2007's Halloween.
Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of Pick 6 Movies. I am one of your hosts, Bo, and uh, with me as ever is the guy that has locked me up for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, how, how are you? How, how, hey, isn't it fun to watch a movie called Halloween in mid-November? You know, as I said in the upfront, uh huh. if Christmas can horn in on the action of Halloween then I'll be damned if Halloween can't horn in on the action of Christmas. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. You got your Christmas and my Halloween. Well, I got my Halloween near your Christmas. Yeah, what what's good for the Christmas goose? Good for the Christmas gander. As Absolutely. Far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Bend over and I'll show you. Is that right? That's yeah. what she said? That's what she said? Is that what you said? I think so. Okay. Well, how are there three movies in the Halloween franchise all titled Halloween? And one of those is technically part three in the chronology of the same timeline. It's like Halloween, Halloween 2, Halloween. It would be like Fast and the Furious, Fast and the Furious, Fast and the Furious, Fast and the Furious, and Fast and the Furious. It's a tonal language, Bo. You got to get with it. Here's the thing, though. Halloween, the most recent Halloween, uh -huh. is actually a direct sequel to Halloween, not Halloween 2. It ignores oh. Halloween 2. So it, I didn't it, know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> All right, look, the continuity of this franchise is all over the place, clearly, because I don't right. know what's going on. It's nonsense. Any, anyone who tells you that they can explain the chronology of the story, the narrative of Halloween uh -huh. through those first eight movies or whatever is a liar. I got a cheat sheet that I put together. Okay. Okay. So there's one timeline where Donald Pleasance is in everything, right? So you got Halloween and Halloween 2. Uh -huh. Then we have Halloween 4, Return of Michael Myers. Halloween uh -huh. 5, Revenge of Michael Myers. And then there's a movie called Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. And here's the thing. They all have Donald Pleasance in them. So if you're watching it and you see Donald Pleasance, you're like, hey, that's one particular timeline. Reset. Because mm -hmm. there's a second timeline that has Halloween 1, Halloween 2. Then we jump to Jamie Lee Curtis as a middle-aged woman. Mm -hmm. and, and we have yeah, Halloween H2O. H2O. Yeah. And then there's Halloween Resurrection. So if Jamie Lee Curtis is a middle-aged white woman and kind of from her Freaky Friday years, we're in the second timeline. And this is where you have Buster Rhymes, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> right, then reset. There's a third timeline where we have this much older Jamie Lee Curtis that picks up after, according to you, Bo, the original Halloween. And she's like an old woman. Uh -huh. And she's running around fighting Michael Myers. That's right. So that's our third timeline. Then reset. We got just Halloween 3 as a standalone. And then reset, we got the movie we're talking about in this season, Rob Zombie's Halloween. Mm -hmm. So Donald Pleasant, middle-aged Jamie Lee Curtis, old-ass Jamie Lee Curtis, the drunk guy who's uh, trying to stop masks from melting kids' heads, and then this Rob Zombie abomination that we're about to talk about. That all, all tracks. And if you've seen Halloween Ends, there's also just a dude named Corey that may or may not be a Michael Myers in waiting. Say what? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's I think not very I've good. seen maybe six of all of these new movies. I know that I saw the original, mm -hmm. and I've seen part two, mm -hmm. and I saw three and four four in the theater i maybe saw that paul rudd one and then i've seen this one and that's it you only need to see three and garrett can back me up on this but actually <laughs> he, he likes all of them but <laughs> the three you need to see are the original 78 halloween uh i saw that one halloween three season of the witch because it has a drunk guy fighting druids right and then the david gordon green halloween from 2013 or 18 17 whenever that that original one came out it's good everything the the two movies that were released after aren't but his original danny mcbride david gordon green original halloween is is a pretty good sort of swan song for the series and the fact that somebody told them that they needed a trilogy is the reason that it, it kind of stinks one of the things that bothers me about halloween is that linus is so confused about the great pumpkin mm -hmm. and it's it's really out there so him hanging out in the pumpkin patch mm -hmm. and it's like he gets it confused with santa claus or something mm -hmm. because in the charlie brown christmas special like at the end he comes out and he lays down some scripture and kind of grounds christmas in the true meaning of christmas You're like linus gets christmas but when it comes to halloween it's like somebody smacked him in the head with a shovel 
And I think it's because he's homeschooled. Oh. Was that a Halloween movie? Uh, Halloween Homeschool? Yeah. That's the- With Busta Rhymes and Linus. Dude, this might as well be <laughs> Halloween Homeschool. The one we're talking about. <laughs> Here, You know what? Here's the thing about the Halloween movies. Uh-huh. Because we've talked about Friday the 13th, and we've talked about Nightmare on Elm Street. And in each of those sequels of that franchise, they all feel like a slightly different flavor. And as many or as few of the Halloween movies I've ever seen, they all feel the exact same. The plots are very predictable. I do not feel that Michael Myers is a very interesting character by and large. He's just sort of this lumbering murder machine and not that Jason Voorhees isn't but they at least had the damn decency to have him fight a carry or I think he fought gremlins or something or you know like a man bat all of these Halloween movies are just identical I have no idea what they did in those Jamie Lee Curtis old lady versions that just came out how they stretched that out into a trilogy has got to be like whatever the hell they did in that is those Hobbit movies yeah. which I didn't see either but you knew that the new ones that they did to to say that they are torturing the narrative is underselling it like that again <laughs> that first one is is good that 2017 one is like oh okay so the experience of halloween the the 78 movie really fucked up Lori strode and she became kind of a weird survivalist lady which makes sense isn't that what happened in that terminator movie we did oh yeah it is a hundred percent a terminator 2 kind of rip off yeah oh i might need to see that now but it's pretty good and you know it's well done and like michael myers is really savage in it and all that stuff what's he been doing the whole time for like 20 years like how, what did he do to get food and live no he was in a mental institution but spoilers for the third one because there's a time jump between all right so there's halloween halloween kills, season and of halloween the witch ends. no 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 the third of the new ones so there, there's oh, halloween shit. halloween kills halloween ends between halloween kills and halloween ends it's a few years and one of the reveals is that michael myers has just been living in the sewer like an alligator for a while jesus christ it's stupid it, that movie is ridiculously dumb <sighs> Like if I sat down and told you the plot of that movie, at a certain point you would just say, you've got to stop. This is too stupid. Yeah, we've had a lot of those conversations. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, all right, so let's talk about this Rom Zombie movie. As you heard in the intro, like there is a perfectly good reason to approach Rob Zombie to do this movie. He was kind of the right guy at the right time as sure. far as rebooting it. Uh huh. But then the decision he makes is we're going to basically split this movie in two. Mm -hmm. And part one is the redneck origins of Michael Myers. And then part two is sort of a loose remake of the original right. film. It's his full metal jacket. Yes, if you will. <laughs> and we open on a quote from the fictional Dr. Loomis uh -huh. that goes, The darkest souls are not those which choose to exist within the hell of the abyss, but those which choose to break free from the abyss and move silently among us. Dude, this sounds like something from some, like, goth girl's Instagram. You get that, and then a title card. And that's all of the credit. So at least that had to make you a little happy. I loved it. I was like, oh, this is going to be a tight, wait a minute, two hours? Oh, goodness. How is this two hours? The original is barely 90 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. They had to like do some extra shooting to get that thing up to feature length. This whole intro to Michael Myers' backstory. It feels like some Rankin and Bass stop-motion holiday special where kids are like, so that's how Michael Myers got his jumpsuit. Oh, so that's why Michael Myers wears a mask. Oh, so that's why Michael Myers wantonly murders people that he loves. Put one foot in front of the other. <laughs> <laughs> and soon you'll be murdering some more yeah it's a real like you know freddy and jason <laughs> so and pinhead but do you recall the most famous killer of all <laughs> all right so we get the title it's haddonfield illinois on halloween yeah. We're outside this house. It's a nice house, but it's all dressed up to look distressed. And we're in maybe the 70s or 80s. I guess it's the 70s because we're going to make some kiss references in a minute. And then we know <laughs> it's Halloween because a text overlay comes up and says, October 31st, Haddonfield, Illinois. There's a bunch uh -huh. of jack-o'-lanterns everywhere. <laughs> and we hear some rock music playing. And we go to Michael Myers, who is in his... Dude, it's not rock music. It's God of Thunder by Kiss. Eh, whatever kiss sucks and 
<laughs> send your emails to Bo at Big Six Movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Com. Real quick, the, the whole first movie takes place on Halloween, right? Mm-hmm. Part of this movie takes place at Christmas. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and it was released at Labor Day. Go figure. What a bunch of shitheads. <laughs> Let's get inside this house and see what's going on. Yeah, so Michael is wearing a clown mask. It's a cheap plastic clown mask that's being held on by a thin piece of elastic. Yeah. And then he's plucking this hamster out of a cage. No, no, no. It's he's got two rats, Bo. Oh, are they rats? Sweetie Pie and Elvis. Yeah, he's 10 years old. If it was any day other than Halloween, and my kid's wearing this cheap clown mask, petting a rat, I'm worried he's going to kill me in my sleep. The rest of the movie is no surprise. Yeah, it's just me sitting in a corner holding a baseball bat. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> trying to protect myself yeah it, you you end up doing the uh nightmare on elm street move of like just eating coffee ground straight out of the jar to yeah snorting no dos <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so he pulls this rat out and meanwhile we do a cutaway to downstairs where rob zombie movie is happening uh-huh his wife sherry moon zombie uh-huh plays michael myers mom she's whipping up some eggs and she turns to her husband which is like one in the line of many mm-hmm. husbands husbands is who's played by william forsyth who we last saw on the rock welcome back to the podcast mr forsyth and in this movie he's a total piece of shit and he's got a leg in a cast and an arm in a cast and you don't know why and you never find out i'm assuming that he just slipped on some pp in the bathroom at costco and is waiting his cash settlement from his lawyer well the actual reason is that bill forsyth hurt himself in real life prior to the because he was like oh movie. shit i gotta be in this movie <laughs> right. hold on i'll fix that he, was, he, t- he took a dive to uh, try to get out of it uh uh-huh. isn't that what harrison ford did with that first star wars remake oh god bless Chewie, him watch this <laughs> oh, i can't be in the movie bullshit harrison ford was trying to get out of that star wars movie like people try to get out of vietnam he's just <laughs> shooting himself in the foot and saying he's gay so michael myers mom just there she's making breakfast and she turns around and she's like i gotta work tonight somebody's gotta make money around here and william forsyth her husband he's like i'm all broken up bitch i can't work dude I, i'm gonna sound like you for a moment here uh-huh the amount of profanity in this movie is ridiculous i suppose there is some culture uh-huh. here in the united states in which this is the way that people talk right but goodness it's vulgar by my standards that i don't normally use that word it's uncomfortably vulgar yeah and all of his movies are like that but you yeah, at a certain point man you gotta try a new gear yeah michael myers mom shouts at her husband and she's like you can't work well whose fault is that and he's like fuck you bitch and then the whole time that these two are screaming at each other peter frampton's baby i love your way is playing in the background see what he's doing here Bo, Mm -hmm. is he's uh, contrasting the volatility of their relationship with the romantic stylings of peter frampton who we last saw in sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band Oh, those were the days. What I wouldn't give for the wholesomeness of Sergeant Peppers right now. Uh, but yeah, and the maybe most disgusting part of this scene, it's really hard to make that kind of call. Uh-huh. But it's when William Forsyth's stepdaughter, because he's not the father of this teenage girl that walks in. She comes in. Her name's Judith Myers. Yeah. Yeah. Just like the original. Sure. So he, he's oh, like. Is that her name? Yeah. Oh, you going to be working down at the Rabbit and Red Lounge with your mom at the strip club? And he's like, look at that ass. He didn't call it an ass. Oh, it's a dumper. That's right. He refers to her ass as her dumper. <laughs> it's so gross. You, you left out an important part that we do see a baby sitting in. It's not a bassinet. It's more of a cardboard box <laughs> used to ship Crown Royal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's real makeshift, to say the least. Yeah, and, and these two are constantly screaming at each other, and their argument takes a pause after William Forsythe says, Bitch, I will crawl over there and skullfuck the shit out of you! Uh-huh, because we gotta get the word skullfuck into the first scene of our movie. Jesus Otherwise, Christ. what are we even doing here? I... 
And so they're screaming back and forth. The baby starts crying. The whole thing is terrible. Then Michael Myers' mom says to Judith, hey, hon, go upstairs and get your brother. And then Judith is all pissed off, but she does so. And I was like, look, this is not a household where people go upstairs and fetch them for breakfast. This is a house where you scream as a form of communication, no matter where a person is in that home. Go get your brother. We're going to have breakfast at the table as a family. Family. No, you're not. <laughs> but so she goes upstairs and Michael Myers, by the way, in the bathroom adjacent to his bedroom Bo. that's nice man oh sure yeah, yeah i shared a bathroom with my dad my brother my sister there was never a time in my life growing up that i did not walk into our family bathroom and smell the shit of another person <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. I didn't realize that until I was an adult. There was one day I just like walked in. I was like, I'm not smelling someone else's turds. Well, I've finally grown up. Today I'm a man. <laughs> but yeah, so he's got a scalpel and is just eviscerating this rat. And the sister, of course, is like, Mike, open the goddamn door. It's breakfast. Yeah, stop jerking off in there. It's like, shut up. Man, you're doing stuff. This rat sucks. It doesn't have any You suck. Guts. Everything sucks. I'm wearing my clown mask because it's Halloween. In case you forgot, it's the name of the movie. Yeah, he just dumps this thing in the turlet and goes about his business. But when he, <laughs> he goes downstairs and he's like, hey, Bob, I need a new rat. Mine sucked. And she's like, all right there, hun. We'll get you a new fucking rat. William Forsyth is having none of this shit. That, that fucking kid needs some dish discipline runs around here like a little bitch he's probably a queer there's a quote from the movie yeah and then he says he's probably just gonna cut his dick and balls off and change his name to michelle i'm like well misogynistic check uh we have pedophile tendencies check uh-huh homophobia slash transphobia check if we can get him to say something racist bo i got white trash bingo <laughs> i mean that does include the confederate flag themed freedom isn't free space in the middle of the board but still i'll take it any way i can get it and just to ratchet things up a little bit as he is confronting kid michael myers william forsyth just rips his mask off and then they just scream about how much they hate each other for a minute yeah it is the most unpleasant opening to a movie i may have ever seen <laughs> i did like when michael myers walked over and he gives a kiss to the baby in the crown royal box uh -huh. and he says good morning boo and i was like wait a minute i get that there's weird halloween decorations and shit all over your house but you have a child named boo and then i thought maybe his mom's a big fan of to kill a mockingbird well there's boo scout and jim are the two illegitimate kids that live in the basement we just don't see them those are the names of his first two rats <laughs> right uh <laughs> and all right so now we follow michael myers to school uh-huh he runs into a bully in the bathroom bo while michael myers is trying to take a pee pee yeah he comes out of the salt and immediately this bully is like hey shit pants what's going on ball liquor and you're like Did you see who played the bully no it was daryl sabara who was that younger brother in those spy kid movies and he was in uh world's greatest dad with robin williams oh remember yeah he hung himself while masturbating uh -huh. well the kid in the movie did not Robin Williams. He just died by hanging himself. I don't know if he was masturbating or not. Nah, he had mental problems. But then again, well, I think we anyone who is strangling themselves while masturbating might have a mental problem or two. Eh, you know, sometimes you just do things because they feel good. <laughs> do you think that masturbating while having a belt around your neck is the risk reward of that worth it? I feel like we've had this conversation on this podcast before. Do I think it's worth it? No, but there are plenty of people who do as evidence by David Carradine, Michael Hutchins, and that kid from <laughs> World's Greatest, World's Greatest Dad. Dad. <laughs> so, you know... There's got to be something to it. I guess so. Three billion serve can't be wrong, you know? I think it's more like that Daffy Duck trick where he drinks all that gasoline and then throws the match in his belly. Like, I can do this, but just once. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but so the reason that the bully is pulling on Michael Myers is he happens to conveniently have an uh -huh. ad for 
Michael Myers mom dancing on a pole at the rabbit and red club. She got stars over her nipples and there's a little skeleton cartoon covering up her vagina. And by the way, the rabbit in red is a nod to the original movie where Garrett will appreciate this. The rabbit in red club was on the matchbook that Donald Pleasance finds when he discovers the guy killed in the field. Oh, really? Yeah. Seems like a terrible name for a titty bar. The rabbit in red. Yeah. Like, call it Thumpers. That's a good name for a strip club. Thumpers. (laughs) Thumpers was across town. Oh. Yeah, they they were trying to capitalize on the success of Thumpers, and Rabbit and Red is just what they came up with. When, where you and I grew up, Uh there was a place called Rent It Center. You know, for people that couldn't afford like a hundred bucks for a couch, you could rent one for five dollars a month forever. Uh-huh. But anyway, it was a rent it center, and then their mascot was this frog, and he would go rent it, rent it, and then they put him in a little like a king's robe, and then somebody came into town and decided to knock off their marketing, and they opened up a thing called King Frog Rental Center. So you had <laughs> Rent It Center with their version of the ribbiting frog, and then there was King Frog Rent It Center. They had a real rivalry, and then I think the the owner of one of them murdered the other one. And then I left town and and then I don't know what happened after that. That's tragic. I need to do some like local research. I could stumble on a real like Jillian Anderson style murder mystery. It was like your own version of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Uh huh. <laughs> Only way more white trash. And without like the sophisticated gay New Orleans <laughs> subculture. <laughs> it would just be like, yeah, I killed that motherfucker. Fuck you, he said. Fuck you, he retorted. <laughs> right. Go fuck yourself, he responded back. I could get then Rob the Zombie to direct up. the film version and. <laughs> Done and done. I'm going to skull fuck you, King Frog. Midnight in the Garden of Rental Furniture. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, when you're in that garden, be careful because there's some broken beer bottles and some old barbed wire that somebody (laughs) threw out. So it's more like Midnight in the Garden of tetanus <laughs> and broken beer necks um <laughs> oh shit so anyway michael myers loses his shit and starts attacking these kids and this is where richard lynch who we last saw mm-hmm. in the amazing invasion usa like a year ago he was here yeah welcome back oh it's been too long richard lynch so he shows up and he's like hey hey hey, break it up and michael myers is like fuck you old man you suck and he's like whoa (laughs) hey i was on your side for like two seconds and michael myers is like a good 18 inches shorter than these two bullies like you you know who is the one who's being picked on and michael myers immediately is just giving double guns to the principal like you want a piece of me too you suck fuck you i'll take on all three of you shit bags (laughs) it's crazy like there is no reason for him to lash out other than just being a crazy little kid but he lashes out at richard lynch in a really funny way cut to michael myers mom showing up dressed like a 1970s era hooker (laughs) with her little rabbit patch fur coat and her short skirt she goes into the principal's office and she's like hey look leave my baby alone he didn't do anything wrong when she shows up what she says is I don't like being called down here all the time. It's like, well, maybe if your kid wasn't such a piece of shit, this wouldn't be as big a problem. And by the way, because your kid is such a piece of shit, we had to call this asshole. Hello, it's me, Dr. Loomis. (laughs) As played by Malcolm McDowell, who will forever and always be Alex from A Clockwork Orange in my mind. That was the first time I really saw him as an actor, and that made an impression on me as a kid. Probably Mm. a movie I shouldn't have watched watched it like the age nine or ten but my parents were busy doing other stuff and they didn't really give a shit what i was up to do you remember bringing that to my house no but i remember having an oversized movie poster of that in my bedroom like if my kid had a clockwork orange movie poster in his bedroom i'd have a conversation with him you saw that movie and then you were like hey Hey, have you seen A Clockwork Orange? And I said, no, because I'm a child. And you said, all right, I'm bringing it over. And you dropped it off and like put it in my mailbox or something, as I recall. And we're like, you need to watch this. And so I did. I watched it completely alone at the age of maybe 15 and was just like, what is this? And yeah that was one of a handful of movies that you were like this has traumatized me so much i need to take it to bow 
I remember that this weirdo I knew named Brett, who uh, he was the guy who gave me that German poo movie. Mm -hmm. And I traumatized at least half a dozen people with that. And then they traumatized people. It was affectionately known as the monkey's paw because everybody (laughs) gave it away and they just constantly tried to recycle it back to the origin. That was a bad movie. Yeah, that's not something... We and, should talk about right or or admit that it ever was seen by anyone. Anyway, all right. So Malcolm McDowell <laughs> shows up, and he's like, "Yes, they called me in because your son is really awful." What, my Mikey? He's awful. He's not crazy. He, you're crazy if you think my little angel's crazy. He's a little sweet baby boy. Where, where's my baby boy? I want to give him a peppermint stick, Mikey. I got peppermint. And then Richard Lynch is like. Not crazy, you say. Well, check in, mate. Let me show you some Polaroids we found in this weirdo's locker. <laughs> what? Well, you should see what's doing in my purse. You should see the Polaroids I got in there. It's full of all kinds of crazy shit. Some of them I took, some of them people took of me. Dude, it is just a litany of pictures of dead animals and stuff. Then they say, oh, well, if that's not enough, we also found a dead cat on him. Yeah, and just in his back pocket, we patted him down, and there was one wrapped around his thigh like he was sneaking it in. That's not a big deal. Look at me. I got a jacket made of dead rabbits. My panties is stitched out of human flesh, big whoop. Huh? You think you're so perfect with your polyester blend suit? Get out of here. What, Mikey? I got peppermint sticks. Mikey. (laughs) Mikey. Where's my boy? And Loomis is like, this could be the sign of much larger problems for your son. This killing of animals and sneaking dead cats around like so much peanut brittle. Yo, wait, you're, you're saying my sweet baby boy did all this to these animals. Like, he loves animals. He's always bringing animals home. He takes them up to his room. Come to think of it, he never seems to bring them back down. I never see him in his room when I'm mopping up all that mystery blood. Eh, you know what? Science will probably explain all this. You got a science teacher right here somewhere? Give me a science teacher. Science teacher! Come explain all this. Mikey, I got peppermint sticks. <laughs> Michael then just books it. He just hauls ass out of here, grabs this clown mask. This sucks. You Everything sucks. I'm getting the hell out of here. From his locker, gets his clown mask, takes off. The original Halloween music kicks in. They only use it three times in this whole film. Yeah. And it's really strange that they don't leverage that more. And he then stalks one of the, the bullies, or the bully. Well, the bully. Yeah. It's just one of them that was talking about making photocopies of his mom's titty pictures and when that bully picked on him he also talked about like his sister sucking him off and his mom giving him anal or something it's like why are we making this so vile you could just have a bully be a bully this whole movie can be summed up by this movie is disgusting and you should not watch it look how happy garrett is watching us talk about this i i can't look at him he's just like smiling and nodding ugh Wipe that smile off your face. <laughs> you know when he edits this all together, it's going to be like 30 seconds long and it's just going to say Halloween is awesome. <laughs> but so Michael stalks this bully into the woods uh-huh. and then just pops out from behind a tree at one point. And the kid's like, oh, what are you doing here, crazy Michael Myers? And he's like, uh-huh. you suck. Look at this stick. It sucks too, but you suck more. And he just starts beating the shit out of this kid with this big ass stick. It is incredibly violent. And this whole scene ends with Michael Myers taking off his shitty plastic clown mask. And then he reaches into the pocket of the bully and grabs the newspaper clipping for the Red Rabbit titty bar. Mm -hmm. And then Michael Myers puts the mask back on and he just finishes the job by continuing to just beat the holy shit out of this kid with this fallen tree branch it is incredibly violent and it's not violent the way slasher movies are violent like it's it's violent in a way that's much more visceral and real which is what i guess rob zombie's going for but that's not what you really want excuse me it's not what i want in a horror movie it's the same mistake they made in that nightmare on elm street remake like grounding it in reality like that's not what we're dealing with here is it? It's not what this movie ought to be. And, you know, Carpenter said himself, like, you're you're kind of demystifying Michael Myers. He's supposed to be this sort of force of nature that is a cipher for whatever, you yeah. know, what, whatever you want him to be. And as soon as you make him this normal or human, it right. defangs him in a way. It both defangs him and, and it just makes it a movie about somebody with a mental illness as opposed to a scary horror movie. But eh. anyway, so cut to later that night and again keep in mind this is all on halloween even though i don't really talk about that and uh william forsyth is there with michael myers and uh, william forsyth is all drunk and he's watching the movie the things with his kid Mm -hmm. did that remind you of you growing up at all uh it reminded me of the original 
Halloween where wow. the kids are watching the thing. Although I did watch the thing probably several times as a kid. Did you ever watch it with your dad when he was like hanging out, <laughs> screaming <laughs> profanities and having a couple of Coca-Colas? I'm sure I watched it while he was passed out in the room. I don't think he was ever <laughs> conscious for a viewing. <laughs> <laughs> he was sleeping he was resting his eyes bo <laughs> resting his eyes thanks to a couple of high lives <laughs> michael myers mom she comes downstairs on her way to work where she strips and michael myers mom screams out judith get out here and take your brother michael myers trick and treating all right he's my baby boy he deserves some candy more than these peppermint sticks michael you want a peppermint stick come here Come here, get a peppermint stick. And then the mom leaves and Judith and her boyfriend, they show up. And Judith is like, go trick-or-treating yourself. This is bullshit. You're too old for this. So then Michael Myers just walks outside and sits on the front stoop like a hump. Better yet, <laughs> music starts playing. There's a, a needle drop here and it's, love hurts. Dude, it's Nazareth. Yeah. And then it cuts to Michael Myers' mom not stripping to this song. She's just kind of swinging around the pole with all of her clothes on. That's mm -hmm. not stripping. Yeah. And inside Judas boyfriend is just trying to get it wet. But this is where the origin, because we need to see where everything came from. He's wearing this William Shatner mask. No, that's inaccurate, Bo. He reaches into wherever his duffel bag and he pulls out a John Carpenter brand Michael Myers Halloween mask. <laughs> <laughs> fair that's fair and, and it looks like this albino al sharpton and the boyfriend's just like i want to wear this while we fuck for anyone watching this movie it's just like what he what why would he wear this in the first movie because michael myers wasn't a thing when he grabs the halloween mask it's just hell it could have been a ski mask it could have just been anything it sort of provided as you said in the intro this level of sort of blank anonymity but when he pulls it out here it's just yeah it's just too much. I don't know. While that's happening upstairs, Michael Myers comes in, finds William Forsythe asleep the way my dad was asleep. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and he just starts eating some candy corn and play it around with it like flicking it like a paper football dude it's it's loose candy corn and loose circus peanuts yeah like whoever's handing this shit out i get that that's the worst halloween candy ever but the fact that it's just loose mm -hmm. makes it even more gross that's only one step above charlie brown getting those rocks in his bag it is yeah how <laughs> fucked up is it in the charlie brown christmas special that like all the kids show up and they all get candy and then charlie brown shows up and the parents in that house chunk a rock in his bag it didn't just happen once it happens multiple times they just conspired to give charlie brown rocks what is worse charlie brown getting a, a succession of rocks uh -huh. because of a conspiracy in the neighborhood yes or somebody telling Linus about this great pumpkin bullshit that nobody else knows about. I think Linus came up with that on his own. I thought you were going to say Charlie Brown getting rocks or just some weirdo reaching in and just giving out sweaty fistfuls of loose leaf circus peanuts. I mean, that's like, rough. That ain't good. If I'm a kid and somebody's thrown out loose leaf circus peanut and just random pieces of candy, I'm calling the cops. Like, oh, cause yeah. that, that, that's not the end of their bad behavior. That's the cherry on top. Get in that house, man. There's some deviant shit going on in there. Oh, a hundred percent. That would be like pouring gravy into a trick or treat bag. Oh, one time when I was a kid, uh -huh. some people came to my house. This was when I was too old to trick or treat. And these two kids showed up and they said, trick or treat. And I looked in their bag and they each had a $5 bill in there. And I was like, what? Where'd you get $5? and they said from the old lady across the street so me and another buddy of mine we uh, went and grabbed a couple of halloween masks and we went over and ding dong trick-or-treated and the old lady showed up and she'd forgotten it was halloween and she's like oh i totally forgot hold on so she went into her refrigerator because she'd run out of cash with those other two kids because she had all her lights off and uh, she gave us both an apple then she closed the door and then the guy i was with who later went to prison he took both of our apples walked around back and uh, pelted her car with them <laughs> <laughs> oh my god back to this stupid movie because there's two hours of there's it's so long anyway so michael myers then grabs some duct tape out of the kitchen and a butcher knife <laughs> this sucks tape it sucks and he <laughs> wraps bill Forsyth up in his recliner <laughs> He doesn't even wake up. Wake up. He's a come, come to. to. Yeah. <laughs> Michael is briefly distracted by some trick-or-treaters outside before he d like looks back at Forsyth and is just like, oh, 
this sucks. I'm going to cut this guy's throat. He sucks. Yeah. And so that's what he does. And he like cuts the guy's throat. William Forsythe wakes up bleeding out of his neck and is just like, bah, 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 and then bleeds out and dies. But at this point, William Forsythe was a real shit bag. Everybody in this movie is a shit bag. Right. But, but we haven't seen Michael. We saw him kill a rat or two. And then we, well, and then we saw him beat a bully to death. So you're like, well, maybe that kid had it coming. And then he kills William Forsythe, who's a shit bag. You're like, well, he kind of had it coming. But then here's where things kind of go off the beaten path of morality. Then Judah's boyfriend is coming downstairs. Covered in sex stink. Right. And she just throws on some headphones because, you know, she doesn't give a shit. And yeah. the boyfriend goes to the fridge, which is really presumptuous to make himself a sandwich. Yeah, with his stepdad passed out in the other room watching black and white horror movies. That's pretty ballsy. Also, you know what this family is like. Do you really want anything from this fridge? No. <laughs> I, mean, I think he's making a sandwich out of what's arguably cat food. It could be cat food sprinkled with crank for all you know. <laughs> anything could be in that fridge. But anyway, he starts making this sandwich and then Michael comes up behind him, brains him with a bat. Yeah. And you suck. It's very violent. Everything is really graphic and violent. Yeah. It's just to get that out of the way. And Don't Fear the Reaper is playing while Michael makes his way upstairs good lord he sees this william shatner mask on the floor puts that on it's not a william shatner mask <laughs> it's the halloween mask right it is a john carpenter brand halloween michael myers mask trademark registered with the miramax logo on the back of it or whatever he puts this thing on Bo, and when he waddles in there he looks like a bobblehead of michael myers like a yeah. mini me michael myers it's adorable when he's waddling around with his little knife and his oversized giant head on his three foot body. He looks like uh, uh, one of them Funko Pops. And the head is huge, man. This mask is so oversized. And he walks in there and his sister's, I don't know, probably smoking a joint or doing something other deviant. And he starts like tickling her dumper mm-hmm. with his fingers. His she turns dumper. around. And she's like, what the, What are you doing, Michael Myers? And then stab, stab, stab. He kills her. She doesn't die right away like he stabs her in the gut and then she kind of staggers out of the room and he follows Ah! and gives her some more slices from behind but when he's Ah! when she's done he then Ah! goes to the baby and is like hey you're the only one around here doesn't suck boo happy Mm -hmm. halloween even though halloween sucks yeah but you don't suck boo you're my favorite so sherry moon zombie comes home with michael on the porch holding this baby and she's like Oh, hey there, hun. What's going on? What are you doing outside? Why are there police <laughs> sirens coming to the house? What's all that blood pouring off of the front stoop? Did you bring some of those more mystery animals in there? Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And then we get a, no, why? And th- then the, all the Where? video goes like sepia toned while we see all these you know shots of the police holding sherry moon zombie back and michael gets loaded There's in the back bullshit of the police tv car. reporter there like giving all the details of what's going on that's not how the news works what t- it's like what two in the morning yeah they're not doing a live news report in the middle of the night that's idiotic just get shit right surprise <laughs> surprise this white trash kid killed his white trash stepfather and white trash sister and her boyfriend mm-hmm. that's like yeah not just below the fold that's like a three right that is not a live broadcast kind of situation no everything in the movie freeze frames and the camera pans over and michael myers is in the back seat of a police car and he turns to look like somewhat toward the camera but not directly at it and then we cut to black boom text overlay smith grove 11 months later and we hear this news reporting from local wnky tv5 that says michael byers was transported to a facility after being found guilty of murder in one of the lengthiest and most expensive trials in the state's history and i was like wait this is 11 months later Mm -hmm. what is your average trial length like 30 minutes or less it's dominoes rules (laughs) for court in Haddonfield, or Smith's Grove. The reporter goes on to say, Dr. Loomis, who we met earlier in the movie, was appointed by a judge to oversee Michael Myers' care at the Smith's Grove Crazy House. And he's going to be in the rest of our movie. Back to you, movie! And we're told also in this report, like, by the way, this weird British guy, Dr. Loomis, is now in charge of everything. And then we cut to Loomis, who's in 
this room with young Michael and like turning on the recording. He's like, listen, Michael, I think I can get a great book out of this. I just need you to open up and say some crazy shit. Then I'm going to write it down and I'm going to make a million dollars. What do you remember about that night? 11 long months ago. It was Halloween night, I do believe. Tell me all about it. He's like, I don't remember anything. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't kill any cats or rats or dogs or some kid in the woods. Oop, shit. I mean, I hope they don't find any kid in the woods who died from falling out of a tree and hitting his head on the same branch over and over as he fell to the ground. Trees suck. You suck. That there's a cut with him talking to Sherry Moon Zombie who is coming to visit him in this facility. Mm -hmm. And he's like, hey, can I go home? This place sucks. And she's like, oh boy, no, hon, you're not going to be able to go home uh, today that or sucks. probably ever because you're, um, what? how to put this politely, um, cuckoo, cuckoo. Oh, well, that sucks. I don't, you don't suck. Hey, let me ask you a question. How's uh, my favorite baby sister, Boo? Is she, is she okay? And my sister, Judith, who I definitely didn't kill with a knife and her boyfriend who didn't kill with a baseball bat or that guy who used to call me queer, who I definitely didn't tie up with duct tape and split his throat from ear to ear with a knife. Are all of them okay, mom? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Hey, who wants a pot pie? Oh, not me. They suck. Oh, well, uh, I'm gonna go. Bye. All right, you suck. I mean, I love you. <laughs> And so then we have a little late night drop in by Danny Trejo, who is in this movie. Is that his first appearance on this podcast? I think it might be. Oh, wow. That's crazy. But you might I know we've right. really somehow danced our way through that minefield miraculously. Talk about walking through the raindrops. He's in everything and, and a lot of bad <laughs> movies, too. It's shocking that we haven't dealt with him before. That can't be yeah. right. Listeners, write in at uh, pick6movies.podcast.bike and <laughs> let us know if we have talked about Danny Trejo before. He shows up and he's a janitor. Mm -hmm. And he goes over to Michael Myers' holding cell. And Michael Myers is inside. He's still a kid at this point. And he's like, hey, Mikey, don't let these walls get you down. I did some time behind bars too. Look beyond the walls. Live inside your head. Take it easy, bro. I'm going to go home and bang my old lady. Adios, amigo. We'll get back <laughs> to him in a minute. We get another scene with Michael and, and Dr. Loomis chit-chatting and michael's wearing this mask that he made for himself that's all black tell me about your mask it's very decorative what does what does that mask mean to you michael <laughs> also if you would can i take some pictures this would great as an insert in the book i'm working on <laughs> and michael is like when i wear this mask nobody sees me and nobody sucks i got secrets all right they don't involve me killing all those people that they said I killed. I got other secrets. I killed some people you don't know about. I mean, you suck. <laughs> plus, plus this mask, it hides my face and I guess my guilt and shame. And I, plus, I look totally badass. My long hair, this cool mask. Dude, there's a great moment, too, where he's like, is anybody ever going to come visit me or does everybody suck? And, and Lewis is like, well, I see you almost every day, Michael, and your mother comes to visit once a week. And, well, that's pretty much it. You've murdered anyone else who might come to visit. And, you know, you're a monster in the eyes of society. So, I don't know, maybe no. you get one of those pin pal brides or something in a few years. <laughs> Here we cut to Dr. Loomis walking past the asylum uh, across like some fake movie snow. And we hear Bing Crosby sing like, deck the halls with boughs of holly, fa la 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 la. And I, I was like, why is Christmas in our Halloween movie? Jack Skellington isn't dancing around on his toothpick legs trying to fuck everything up. That should not belong in this film at all. Yeah. And then we get to see Dr. Loomis and Michael Myers having some scream therapy where this adult and this child are just yelling at each other. Fuck you. Fuck you. No, fuck you. You suck. Fuck you. You suck more. <laughs> it's so bad. It's a real like, I, the whole world sucks. I hate everyone. It is with Michael Myers just going like, I just want to go home. And yeah. Dr. Loomis says, well, Michael, you can't go home. You've done terrible things. And then he hugs Michael Myers and you're like, oh, they're making a connection. No, they're not. You've been a bad boy. <laughs> and anyway, so Sherry Moon Zombie uh, is walking around with Michael, who's got his mask on, and she kind of lifts the mask off his face to talk to him. And he's like, quit it, Mom. You suck. This mask rules. Ah, jeez. Every time I come to see you, you, you got more and more of the sass mouth. Hmm. Last night when I was dancing around showing my cooch and ninners to cotton everybody, <laughs> I was thinking about how much i missed you and how much i'd like you at home and how you can never come because what a horrifying monster you've become 
Yeah, and then this one fella, he snorted a line of cocaine off of the, the top uh, floor where I was dancing, and he rolled the dollar up, and he stuck it right up my pooper, and some of the coke got inside of me, and I got real high. I went home, and I married that fella, and I swore the next morning when I woke up, that was it. I'm never going to get married again, and I was going to come here today and bring you this picture of your little sister, Boo, that you can tuck between the padded walls of the cell they stick you in because you're fucking crazy, and <laughs> uh, and then I, I'm, I'm probably never going to come back and see you again or something like that probably yeah so she slips him a picture before she pieces out of yeah. him and the baby yeah and as she's leaving loomis walks her to her car and he's like you should probably never ever come back we're just going to lock this crazy son of a bitch up let me take you out i have some documents for you to sign <clears throat> excuse me nurse nurse dead meat <laughs> w- would you be so kind as to come in here and sit next to michael myers preferably with your back to him as you read a newspaper or some sort of women's day magazine ah oh, thank you nurse dead meat so the nurse is is hanging tight with michael who picks up this fork mm-hmm. and w- as soon as you see that you're like oh she's she's toast i'm gonna stick a this in you because you're done i gotta work on my catchphrase maybe if i just stopped talking completely maybe that would be cooler than if i had sucky one-liners like oh who's that guy arnold schwarzenegger hold on come on michael Myers, you got this come on you don't suck you're awesome think of oh I got it. Hey, Nurse Deadmeat, Mm -hmm. fork you. And he just starts stabbing her with the the fork and kills her. Yeah, yeah. Just straight up murders her. Sirens go off and alarms and everybody comes running, including his mom and Dr. Loomis. And Michael Myers is just going fucking batshit crazy, snapping at his mom with his teeth and swinging bloody forks and pissing and shitting himself. So, And at that point, you kind of know like, oh, he is not just never getting now like loomis and and his mom have just written him off yeah and so we cut to home movies of michael myers as a baby Mm -hmm. while sherry moon zombie is watching crying on the couch and there's shots of him with boo Uh the baby like he's hugging her and kissing her and they all like happy beside one another and they're like oh i bet michael myers just murdered one of the neighborhood cats in that film and then sherry moon zombie pulls out a handgun thankfully not from her vagina Like they did in (laughs) Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh Uh-huh. And she just shoots herself in the head. Yeah. You know, Bo, just end the movie there. The end. There's your Halloween remake. It's a prequel. It's not very good. And just, good night, folks. Drive safe. Thank you for coming out. There is a baby crying in the background, like Boo, as we, we find out. But that is, again, just the nihilism of this movie, of the mother murdering herself with the baby crying nearby that's that is the vibe of this what is enjoyable or entertaining about this film i don't know i think it's it's what i dislike about this movie is that it is so grungy and nasty and off-putting that i just don't find any enjoyment it's like constantly smelling a stranger's armpit and i don't mean like an attractive stranger (laughs) like just like someone who's passed out in a public park smelling that person's armpit then chad we get an insert 15 years later, and we cut to Danny Trejo, and you know it's 15 years later because now he's got some hoard rim glasses and a, a little, you know, yeah. snows on the roof. <laughs> And he's trading this new guard as they're going to Michael Myers' room. And he's like, listen, buddy, you don't want to fuck around with this guy, okay? And the guy's like, hey, I think I know a little bit about mistreating mental (laughs) patients. You don't have to tell me my job, pal. And then, clank, they open up the door and go inside Michael Myers' cell. And, dude, Mm -hmm. Michael Myers is busying himself with a very lucrative Etsy business, handcrafting paper mache masks of all sizes and themes and colors and textures. He's found his vocation, Bo. The, the, he's, he's a maker of the lost art of masks. Yeah, yeah, that's right. This new orderly was like, let's go fuck nut. Danny Trejo is like, hey, you don't have to treat Mikey like that. And the guy's like, hey, I don't come to your place of business and knock the <laughs> dicks out of your mouth, do I? I think I know my way around insulting and abusing a mental patient. I'm going to take one of his masks and I'm just going to wipe my taint with it. And Danny Trejo is like, hey, oh, don't, 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 right. don't touch his masks. Me and Mikey were buddies. We got something special. Mikey would never hurt me. 
Never, ever, right, Mikey? We're pals, amigos, friends. Look at this. Mwah! I love him. He loves me. Best friends forever. Of course, he doesn't ever speak. Uh. At this point in the movie, he is done talking. They take him to Dr. Loomis, and to the point about him not speaking, Loomis is like, Michael, uh, it's crazy, but you haven't spoken in almost twice as long as my first marriage. Oh. And he does a, like a, a moment of realization. He actually says, Whoa. Like that information is kind of sinking in. I didn't realize it's been so long. I'm lonely a lot. Have you ever wondered, Michael, why it is that I come to see you every single day? It's because outside of these walls, I have nothing else to do. I buy my groceries day to day. I don't shop for a whole week. I'm lonely, Michael. That's why I'm here with you. Dude, he says to, to Michael Myers, like, you're probably my best friend in the world. How fucked yeah, how up fucked is up that? am I? You don't even talk. Yeah, right. But then he's like, but, you know, I have a book to write and this yes. is my last day. So best of luck. Toodles. <laughs> right. Toodaloo. He goes and the next scene is him giving this lecture about the book that he has written based on Michael Myers and these murders called The Devil's Eyes. Michael Myers was a perfect storm of fuck uppery that caused him to be so cray cray. <laughs> look into his eyes. Stare into his eyes. It's like looking at a doll's eyes. Wait, what are those lawyers coming at me? It's not plagiarism. I didn't write it down. I, I was quoting someone else. There is... This giant size picture of Michael Myers in the background of the scene where he's giving mm -hmm. this lecture, just staring down at him and the audience. And it's one of the few shots in the movie where I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. I just want to say one positive thing about the movie. That's, that's all. nice. Yeah, well, you know, I don't like to be completely negative. Now let's get back to some really <laughs> shitty stuff. There's these four security guards that are all actors from the Rob Zombie stable of actors who are in his movies. One of which is Leslie Esterbrook, who was Sergeant Callahan from those Police Academy movies. She was the tall blonde with the large breasts. She was also mm -hmm. Laverne and Shirley's neighbor, Rhonda Lee, when that show ran out of ideas and they all moved to California in like the last <laughs> two or three seasons of that show. Also, you've got Bill Mosley in the mix, who was uh, Chop Top in... Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, among other things. Like, he's been ar around. Again, this is just Rob Zombie shoving every actor that's ever been in a horror it's like, movie. It's like watching an Adam Sandler movie. Like, all of his buddies yeah. show up to get to wet their beak. Yeah, for yeah. sure. They're all waiting to move Michael Myers, and they get him all shackled up, and he's wearing uh, a mask, of course. Where's he going? Huh? To jail he's got these chains and leather restraints on his legs and his chest it's all kind of kinky he kind of looks like king kong he's all like strapped up and as the guards are moving him he just starts snapping all this shit piece by piece oh he totally just hulks it just yeah. and the female guard she comes in with a shotgun she shoots at michael myers but he grabs another guard and uses his body as a shield and stops the buckshot but here's an idea female guard shoot him again i just keep mm -hmm. shooting it's not like this is the Revolutionary War. You gotta pack this thing with buckshot. Boom, boom, boom. He rips the throat out of one guard's face, and then he drags the lady cop off. And then we cut away from that to Danny Trejo, who's just got his, like, lunchbox and is whistling a jaunty tune, leaving for the day. Oh, you know what? I need to go drop off this I'm gonna miss you so much Mikey card. Let me sign this real quick. You are the best, Danny Trejo. He's gonna like this. <laughs> best friends forever. <laughs> got it. I'm going to give him a Zagnut. He loves Zagnuts. So it, the phone's ringing inside like this guard shack. How many people work at this hospital, Bo? Like five, Danny Trejo and the four dead guards? Yeah, seven. There's no one else there. I hate this movie. Oh, it's terrible. Anyway, so he's kind of looking around like, hey, where's the guard? Hello? Nowhere. Okay. Hello? Is anybody work? Oh, wait, that's right. I'm the only one who works here at night, <laughs> which is okay because there's only one other crazy person in this whole hospital, Michael Myers. <laughs> right. It's a uh, like a self serve kind of mental <laughs> institution where you set your own hours and your own boundaries. But yeah, the the camera moves ever so slightly over, and you see that there's this woman who has been beaten and is dying while the phone rings. Uh, Gloria is her name. We know that because Andreo is like Gloria. Where are you? And so. Danny Trejo steps around the corner and just walks into a massacre in the hallway. Yeah. Adios mio! He turns around and stares right into the chest of Michael Myers. Who's like eight feet tall, by the way. And he gives it a like, 
Oh boy, Michael, you really stepped in it now. I gotta get you back to your cell, okay? No, this is just your old pal just trying to get you home. I gotta put these cuffs on you. No big deal. It's just you and me, pal. Get you back in your own bed. And then Michael Myers just grabs him and then shoves his face into a sink. And we get like some POV shots as Danny Trejo's face is shoved again and again Mm. into the water. He lets him pop up long enough to go like, Mikey, I thought we were best friends. Look at him. Mikey, look at my back pocket. There's a card that... You need to read read it. And then Michael Myers plucks a TV off of a stand that's like hanging up in the corner. And he just drops it on Danny Trejo's head or something and kills him. Drops a TV on him. The old Magnavox. And in the background, you dropped a bomb on me plays. (laughs) Right. So Loomis gets a phone call in the middle of the night. From who, Bo? None other than Clint Howard, who was like, you got to get down here. And so Loomis shows up. And he's like, what the hell is going on? Dr. Loomis, you won't believe what happened. Michael Myers killed a bunch of people. And that's not the worst of it. He's escaped. I called my brother Ron, asked him if he could get me out of this movie. He no. said no. He said I signed the contract. I've got to do I it. I had his lawyers look at it. He's got Apollo 13 lawyers. We cut to a car wash for 18 wheelers. Is that where, what it is? Yeah. And then we hear okay. Rush's Tom Sawyer playing. Modern day for your mean, mean, strive to taste Tom Sawyer, mean, mean, pride. That's what you play when you don't want the garishness of George Thorogood's Bad to the Bone to establish the <laughs> mood of your movie. Let us know we're around some real bad dudes, Bo. For those people keeping score at home, I hate Kiss and Rush. <laughs> movie's hitting on all cylinders (laughs) so we cut to this 18 wheeler and out steps a character named big joe grizzly and he looks like ernie hudson dressed up as james brown pretending to be chuck yeager it's ken for e is the actor's name who garrett will know as the one of the lead actors from george romero's dawn of the Dead. i think he showed me an action figure of this guy from a movie that is absolutely possible I got to tell you about, hey, Garrett, can you turn off our mics for a second? I'm going to be so glad when Uh, Garrett's gone. He's exhausting. (laughs) Yeah, you're good. Good. You can turn him back on. Hey, Garrett, can you uh, turn that back down for two seconds? I know. I like horror movies too, but this guy's insufferable. Okay, we're good, Garrett. (laughs) He's so weird. Did he show you all of his tattoos? Oh, yeah. He's covered in them. I don't need to see your ghost face from Scream tattoo on your calf, man. I get it. You like horror movies. He told me he has a machete tattooed on his dick and i was like i don't want to see this at all he told me it was a switchblade <laughs> and when it got it erect the blade came out he's a liar and a weirdo by the way i now kind of want that tattoo Garrett, best of the worst we love you Garrett. please don't kill us he's a a, a real kid michael myers waiting to happen <laughs> So we're at this shitty truck stop. Big Joe Grizzly, Bo, he goes in the bathroom to take a shit and read a copy of Swank Magazine. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with this fine periodical, it was an adult pornographic magazine targeted at male readers. And it was published by the manga group, the fine folks behind such monthly magazines as Cherry Club finally legal genesis genesis presents eager beavers genesis presents right <laughs> gent high society hot and older nugget stag and sweet 18 all magazines that are available in sanitary plastic wrap on the top shelves of unsavory newsstands or behind the counters of less reputable gas stations around these united states <laughs> so because we haven't had taking a shit in our movie I think this fills up the bingo card for (laughs) least enjoyable movie. Big Joe Grizzly does accuse Michael Myers of coming in there to have sex with him or whatever. Because he's like, if you're looking for some action, you better take it on the arches or you're going to be one sorry load. And then Big Joe Grizzly pulls out this giant knife, the kind that a weirdo might get tattooed on his dick. And then Uh he's like, I'm Joe Grizzly, bitch. I'm going to cut that mask off your face. And then Michael Myers just starts beating the holy hell out of Joe Grizzly, ultimately stabbing Joe Grizzly with his own knife. But then Michael Myers takes Joe Grizzly's jumpsuit but Mm -hmm. wouldn't that be covered in blood Uh, that sounds like a detail we don't need to worry about maybe had a tide stick on him (laughs) good as new (laughs) yeah i like the idea of michael myers being like well look i might be messy but i'm not sloppy oh raspberries another drop of blood oh wait fresh as a daisy he takes it to a one of those like 
two hour dry cleaner. <laughs> he gets it martinized. <laughs> uh huh. I need you to clean this and not ask a lot of he questions. He just stands there in the lobby in his white underwear and his weird, pasty William Shatner mask, as mm-hmm. you call it. It's his me mask. The girl from Ipanema playing on music. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and some old lady walks in with her dog on a long leash and she sees him and then they acknowledge each other and then the old lady walks out because that's right, funny right. it's just a little nod of recognition to one another we should write shitty movies we're better than this <laughs> we don't have time to do it but we can hey, do it i already have chad i'm one step oh, ahead yeah, of you right. i already did that <laughs> Yeah, I had a couple of them. You're right. I got a couple of shitty movies out there. Is this really that hard? I mean, together? No, it's not hard. I did it. And I don't know shit. All right, so Michael Myers, he finally gets his Santa Claus suit, and off he goes to wantonly murder. So we cut to Haddonfield, Illinois on Halloween, according to the text overlay. And we're in this like a suburban neighborhood. We see a home, and here we meet uh, a mom who's played by everybody's favorite mom, Dee Wallace. You know, Bo, she was the mom in Mm E.T., and you mentioned she was the mom in Cujo, Mm -hmm. and she was also the mom in Critters Mm -hmm. and Popcorn, and she played the Mm -hmm. stepmom in the Dennis Rodman biopic, As Bad As I Want to Be, the Dennis Rodman story. And I find it insane Mm -hmm. that this movie had the balls to cast Dee Wallace as the mother of a teenager for a movie that came out in 2007 when she played the mom of a teenager in the movie et 25 years earlier well you know sometimes accidents happen chad maybe she's irish isn't that crazy because normally like she would be playing what the ghost of the dead grandmother (laughs) (laughs) yeah the ghost so she's playing mrs strode the mom there's a dad daddy strode who is probably famous for something but who gives a shit and the movie because we can't have anything nice in this film chad immediately lori strode the you know, again from the original movie the one who's kind of the innocent yeah. she's talking about some dude molesting her and touching her the yeah, wrong the way dad's complaining that they're like shutting down halverson's hardware store and then she's like oh yeah well mr halverson he used to come in and touch me on my tititatas and she's like wiggling bagels in front of her breasts like this is the kind of shit that caused that nightmare on elm street remake to happen Lying about some guy being a pedophile when he's not. So just watch your mouth, Laurie Strode. Also, Bo, how are we well over an hour into a two-hour movie and we are just now meeting our main character? Sort of. This is like that shit they pulled that Friday the 13th remake. You're trying to do something different, and I, I recognize that part of it. But also, who am I supposed to like or care about in this Nobody. Movie? Yeah. Right. By the way, filmmakers out there... Make sure you have one character that's not a total dirtbag. Yeah, just have a character that your audience identifies with, that they root for. When everyone's a mm-hmm. shitbag, it doesn't matter. It's just a royal rumble. You just pick somebody <laughs> right. and hope that your horse wins, just so that you can have bragging rights. Right, there's no emotional engagement at any point in no. this movie. Because maybe you have some sympathy for Michael Myers up to the point he murders people. But that's it. Lori's not a good person. She seems terrible. Her friends seem worse yes. than her. I guess maybe her parents? <laughs> Maybe I th- those are the only people in this movie that I'm like, ah, I kinda, there's a scene that we'll talk about in a minute where they're just on the porch together chatting. And it's like, well, that seems like a way that normal people would talk well, to one another. But then that short lived. We'll get that in a minute. The dad comes over to Lori and he's like, hey, hon, could you walk down to that creepy abandoned house uh, a couple blocks over and stick this envelope in the door? Because apparently I'm a real estate agent or maybe a lawyer or maybe I run a title company. Or maybe I'm an extortionist or a kidnapper. Who knows what I am? Doesn't matter. I'll be dead soon. Meanwhile, uh, Lori heads out to do that very thing. And Tommy Doyle chases her down, the the kid that she's going to be babysitting. (laughs) And is asking her something about a Mexican wolf man or something? I was like, is this the racist part of the movie I was waiting for? Turns out, no. He's just talking about that poor kid who had that weird genetic condition where he was all covered in hair. This kid's like, did you hear about him? He's a real werewolf, I tell you. It's true. 
And you're my babysitter. That's important in the movie. All right, let's end this scene. Cut to Michael Myers right. walking into a basement somewhere. Is he at the truck wash? Uh huh. I don't know. So he pries up some boards, and it you know it turns out he is in the attic. I think of his old house. No, he's in the basement, and he rips up the floorboards because he goes down the stairs, and he finds the big knife that he used to kill his sister, and then he pulls out the John Carpenter brand Michael Myers mask from Miramax <laughs> and whatever other company from japan helped to finance this movie and he pulls it out i can't be for certain but i'm sure they played the halloween music here so michael myers is now just going to be dressed up as grown-up michael myers right. is that what's going That's on right. and so he watches from inside as laurie drops off the key uh -huh. and tommy won't go near the house because he's a relatively smart kid is yeah. like no fuck that yeah. uh that's that place where that weird kid murdered all those people that place is haunted yeah, as 15 hell. years ago it's just been sitting there abandoned mm -hmm. no it hasn't that, yeah that's a good deal that's how an amityville horror happens yeah, you could get that place for a song. Boy, it's the deal of a lifetime. Tom. I would be more bothered by the fact that local teenagers just go in there and get drunk and high and have sex. Can you imagine all of the used rubbers just stuck oh, to the walls? The number of pentagrams spray painted on the walls of this place. Melted candles. Yes. Empty cans of Keystone Light. Or Bartles and James Bart bottles? Yeah, <laughs> definitely Bartles and James. A lot of wine coolers floating around. If you don't know what a wine cooler is, it's that same spritzer shit that White Claw and Bud Life watermelon and... Just email us at pick6 at bartles.james. Dot net dot carrot. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so there's Lori talking with her friends, Annie and Linda. Which one has the dark hair? That's Annie. All right. Annie That's has played dark by hair. Daniel Harris. Yeah. Linda has light hair. Linda light. Yeah. All right. Linda has light hair. And Annie, the actress who plays her, she was the actress who played the little girl in part four and five. Like That's they right. recast her mm -hmm. in this movie. You see her naked in a little bit. Well, you bit. see both, both of Annie them and Linda. It's not gratuitous Russ Meyer sexy booby movie. It's more like crime scene photo nudity. Even when there's no blood, it still feels dirty it, and right, gross. It's not titillating or anything. Mm, it's it's off-putting. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Anyway, they were talking about their big plans. Michael is watching from across the street. Just wearing a Halloween mask. Hanging out on the yeah. street in the middle of the day in a jumpsuit and a creepy mask staring at three teenagers in a library. <laughs> what? So Loomis finally goes to meet... I forgot Clint he was Howard. in the movie. Who, Loomis? Yeah, because in the first one... He's like in 70% of the scenes. In this movie, he's barely in this film. Until the end. He, he kind of has a significant part at the end of the movie, but it's, anyway, right. we'll get to all that. So Dr. Loomis goes to meet with Clint Howard huh. and Udo Kier, by the way, from 2001, among other films. And Loomis is just like, I can't believe you let Michael loose. This is going to make for a great second book, but I'm very angry about it. Do you have any idea where he might be going? Of course I do. Also, we need to track him down in Udo Kia here and his army of shirt tuckers up there. <laughs> and I was like, wait a second. Let me pause right there. Shirt tuckers? What insult is this? Is that middle class or business casual? What are you trying to insult here? He's just making a fashion statement. Yeah, and then he's like, you all know where Michael is headed. He's going to Haddonfield. In Kentucky? Field, and I've got to get... No. Illinois, or possibly Did you say Haddonfield or Haddonfield? I, well, now that you've said it, now and I'm you questioning Illin it. Illinois? Uh, Haddonfield. Yeah. Yes. My brother shot some of Parenthood there. I was in that movie, I'm pretty sure. I'm in most of my brother Ron's movies. You know, I'm Ron Howard's brother. Do you think that you could set up a meeting? I would love to write a book about yeah, that. Yeah, of course. I, like, I can call Ron three times a year, and I've called him twice already. I could use the third call to try to get you some sort of an interview. Let me ask you one other question. Were you that weird little child yes! in Star Trek? Of course. Oh, no. That was me. The weird child in everything. And I'm also the weird adult in most things. Probably he cuts off as soon as he hears weird. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that was me. What's well, not the first? First time he's been asked. <laughs> it's huh? Very true. All right. So <laughs> Lori and Linda are doing an after school walk and talk about how the cheerleader coach is a cunt because I don't know that we've used that word in the movie yet and we've got to offend everybody. Yeah. She also refers to the cheerleading coach as Lady Fuckface because she gave them three new cheers to learn. And I was like, why don't we just rocket commando and flash some snatch? And I was like, what? <laughs> I like, hate pause this movie. No high schooler, let alone a 
female, let alone a cheerleader, uses the phrase rocket commando or flash some snatch. You know who uses language like that? Adults in Rob Zombie's household. Him and his wife. I don't even know that they talk to each other like that. I think this is some like heightened reality, but I don't know. It's flash tough to say. It's just snatch. Ugh. It's the worst. What's worse, snatch or twat? Mm, twat. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, Garrett earmuffs. Um, <laughs> the thing is, Lords of Salem isn't like this. Like, it's got a lot of weird nudity in it, but it's not profane the way that this one uh -huh. is. It makes it a much more elegant kind of movie. Like, that is a movie that I will stand by, and even if you don't like it, I which I totally get because it's a super weird movie, but Lords of Salem is still one that I'm like, this is a legitimate movie. And I don't know that Halloween feels that way. This doesn't feel like a real movie. Linda says to her, you know what that dried up fucking bitch cheerleading coach did? She called my dad and told him what I said. That cunt needs to get laid. And I'm like, I just, I was so exhausted at this point. Like I knew how this was going to end badly. Yeah. And I was just like, I can't believe I got to slog through this. So anyway, Annie comes over and says, hey, bitches. She's like, hey, Linda, heard about your cheerleading stunt where you told Miss Stank Gash that you wanted to flash your puss to the school. You're such a slut. Hey, look over there. That guy in the jumpsuit with no blood that smells like Tide Stick and the Halloween mask. I think he's watching us. So they're shouting out. Hey, them. asshole, you want some of this young stuff? Why don't you come and get it? And they're like rubbing their crotch and screaming at him. And he's like, my dad's the sheriff. He'll shoot you in the dick and plant child pornography on you and get away with the murder. He's done it before. He'll do it again. All right, it's called the Kruger <laughs> effect, you weirdo, pervert, pornographer, pedophile. You just want to get in my panties, jerk asshole. Michael Myers is just like, oh my God, these girls suck. <laughs> They're so foul-mouthed, and I thought I was foul-mouthed, but these girls are really bad. I'm, this sucks. I'm getting out of here. And so they take off, and then we get Brad Dourif. Welcome to the movie, Brad Dourif. Sheriff. Oh, Brad. man. A anytime he shows up in a movie, it makes it slightly better. <laughs> and slightly worse at the same uh, time. I love Brad Dourif. I stand by him in, in all ways. He's like the the black olives of actors for me. Like, you have some, I'm eating some pizza, I'm like, oh, there's black olives on? Like, mm, yuck. This isn't terrible. Maybe it's a little better. No, it's gross. But it's also good. <laughs> oh, I can't make up my right. mind. Yeah, he, he pulls up beside me. He's like, hey there, kids. Anyone need a ride? Oink, oink. No way, 5-0. Pigs suck. You trying to get in my panties? I'm a cheerleader. Did that bitch whore cheerleading coach tell you to come down here and arrest me for being a some pedophile bait? Because that's what you are, pedophile. QAnon conspiracies. Pizza Gate, All George right Soros. There, Linda. You know what I'm talking about, how? Brad okay. Dorif. Yep, and uh, the election was stolen. <laughs> okay, so Annie, how about you? You want to take a ride? And so Annie does get in the car because <laughs> um, she's lazy. And she didn't want right. to walk. See you bitches later. I'm getting a ride in a patrol. <laughs> and car. also, Linda and Lori at this point are just like, "See a bitch, see a slut," and then they take <laughs> off. That's not far from the truth. Yeah, like, yeah, I know. <laughs> then Sid Haig shows up in the movie, <laughs> showing Loomis around this graveyard, and it's the scene, you know, again from the original where Donald Pleasance finds that Judith Myers' headstone is gone. Is it the sister or the mom's headstone? It's the sister, Judith. Uh, I thought it was his mom's headstone. She probably doesn't have a headstone because she didn't have a head because she blew it off with her shot with her right. handgun. She just has a stump right. stone. And because it's a Rob Zombie movie, instead of just like, well, those kids playing pranks, Sid Hague is just like, those goddamn cocksucking motherfucking kids. And they cut <laughs> to what used to be the headstone, and now it's this makeshift cross with this dog carcass tied it's to it. It's either a dog or a fox or a coyote or something. It's, I think later they say it's a coyote or something, but who cares? So Michael Myers stalked and killed a coyote to leave mm -hmm. as the headstone for his dead sister mother. That's right. All right. And Loomis says, I know who did this, and then just takes off, leaving Sid Haig there to deal with all of this. I guess, which makes sense, because it's not like he's going to lend a hand with a shovel or something, but still. Dude, he just took that shovel, whacked that stick with the dead coyote on it, scooped it up, and chunked it over into the bushes. 
done and done. It's Miller time. He just waited for Loomis to like go over the crest of the hill and then just left it all there. He probably stuck it in his pocket, took it home and ate it. It's like, mm, he's good eats. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, honestly, not a shocker in a Rob Zombie no. movie. If the, if we just did a cutaway like 10 minutes later from this scene, and it's just Sid Haig eating the raw, disemboweled fox or whatever. None of us would be surprised. Be like, yeah, that makes, yeah sure. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, all right, so Linda and her dirtbag boyfriend decide that they're going to have sex in the Myers house, to your point earlier. And it's not because it's the creepy murder dead house. It's just a place where they can go have sex and drink beer and That's sling right. their used rubbers at the wall. Because if it sticks, you right. get a wish, which is normally, please don't let me be And pregnant. night has fallen, just to be clear, yeah. ooh, ooh, where we are in the movie. Ooh, ooh. Oh, and it's also Halloween night. That's right. As they go into the house, the camera moves up and you see that Michael is kind of on the widow's walk above sure. her. I expected to see him coming down the chimney. <laughs> <laughs> so inside, Linda and her boyfriend are fucking and he comes real fast. Was she screaming at him to not have an orgasm? Because that's how they do it. In right. Like, don't do it yet. I'm going to. No, don't. Wait for me. <laughs> right. When uh. the reality is... Oh, you came faster than me? Well, guess who's going down? <laughs> That's how we work that out. Nobody has to yell at anybody. Nobody's got to get mad. She tells him, go downstairs and get me a beer. And he's like, all right. And I'm like, why is the beer downstairs? It's not in the fridge because there's no electricity in this house. You just left your cooler there? You're trying to get in your steps? Dude, also, he is walking out the door like, how would you rate that? Like a 50 on a scale of 10 as far as me making you come? Shut up, shithead. Give me a beer. So, oh, yes, so ma'am. Bad. Oh, I hate this so much. And so Linda throws on Don't Fear the Reaper, like the beginning of Jesus the movie, Christ. while Bob goes to the van, I think is where the beer I is. I thought it was just downstairs. Because then he runs into Michael Myers, who has hilariously decided to drape a sheet over himself like Charlie Brown. <laughs> and he's wearing the glasses that, like, uh -huh. on the outside. Which, in the original movie, there's a guy wearing glasses, and Michael Myers kills him. And then Michael Myers uh -huh. hilariously puts the sheet on and then puts the glasses on the outside so that the girlfriend thinks it's her boyfriend who just got her pregnant, but she neither of another pregnant. Yeah. And, Something got your ghost, Bob. Right. And, and in that, you're yeah. like, oh, it, it is a effective haunting scene. But in this, it's like, wait a minute. Are you proactively dressed up like the guy you're going to kill? Who? Wait, why are you doing this? Is it because you saw the original Halloween and now you're... I, uh, it, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, by this point, though, in the movie, I'm just so worn down by how dreary and ugly everything is that I just want it to be. What time of day is it in this movie right now? Like 5 p.m.? 7 p.m., 8, 9, something. It can't be that late. Because we're about to go see some people waiting for trick-or-treaters, and then Lori's going to go do her babysitting gig at starting at what time? I, I know. I know. It, I, I mean, I right. We're not worried about any of right. So Michael Myers stabs the boyfriend and pins him to the wall, which is what happens in the first movie. And then Michael Myers walks in, and we get to see the blonde-headed friend naked, and we see her breast, and it's not sexy at all. And then she's screaming, where's my beer, motherfucker? And then he grabs her and strikes strangles her right and she's mm -hmm. naked the whole time and she didn't get to finish that beer she didn't get to start nope. that beer and then he just kind of drags her body down the hall end of you know Linda. michael myers has no motive in this movie like in the original that's kind of the point you know like you said he's just this unstoppable force of evil who you know killed when he was a kid and now he's back to kill some more but in this movie we just have all this complicated backstory that should establish a motive to his actions but it doesn't it's just a bunch of stuff that happens it doesn't yeah. matter no all, all of that is correct also chad before we even get started talking about this, I would bet dollars to donuts this is all improv because of the way that they're talking to each sure. other, and it is unwatchable. Yeah. Dr. Loomis goes into this gun shop to buy a handgun from Mickey Dolenz, who was in the 1960s Beatles knockoff band, The Monkees, which when I was a kid, mm -hmm. I was a big Monkees fan. I like that sure. show. And Dr. Loomis says to Mickey Dolenz, I'll take it. Just wrap it up. I understand there's a 
three-day waiting period for me to legally buy a handgun here in the state of Illinois. Unless, of course, you know my friend Mr. Benjamin Franklin and his associate Mr. Lincoln and um, his twin brother Mr. Lincoln and their plus one Mr. Washington, as well as $75 in Kohl's cash. I'm trying to bribe you, sir. <laughs> it's a whole lot of like, oh, yeah, no, there, there's no waiting period. You can just take it. Oh, I can take it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and take it. Oh, I, I could just leave. Yes, yeah. And, and you're just like, what is this scene even about? Like you were saying earlier, we don't know what the hell time it is at any point in this movie. And so if Loomis just suddenly has a gun i'm not gonna be shocked i'm not gonna be like well how did he get right that? he just reaches in his pocket he pulls out a handgun like oh he has a gun it's not like you're gonna be thinking what kind of magical raincoat is he wearing what else could, <laughs> right. could he pull a pull cue out of there you know <laughs> captain <laughs> came <Caveman. laughs> right. like he just he's has a, a gun and an umbrella got it. you're yeah. in america he's got a gun so does everybody right, else. Right. The least surprising thing you could pull out of a coat in America is a gun. The most sure. surprising, by the way, a book. <laughs> That's topical humor. We cut to Laurie and her mom. They're sitting on the front porch of their house and they're handing out candy to trick-or-treaters who are not coming around to trick-or-treat. Laurie's dad comes out to smoke a cigarette and he says, hey, Laurie, uh, be careful when you go out tonight. Nutcases come out on Halloween. And Laurie says, ah, oh, dad, I'm just babysitting. Starting when, I guess, maybe seven or 11, maybe it's four in the morning who knows i'm off dad and so about this time the brunette friend annie pulls up in her car laurie hops in and vroom, off they go and the dad says uh, to the mom you want to go inside and fuck a little while and the mom's like mm, we'll fuck later why don't we go inside and let's talk about our upcoming vacation i'll build a fire so mom goes inside dad takes a puff off this marlboro light he immediately gets punched in the face and then stabbed in the belly by michael myers yeah the one moment in this movie of these two adults like you know you want to go full around because it's not overly vulgar the way that the rest uh, of the movie is oh, that's how i remember it, it well because that's just the default <laughs> but it really is like uh, you know hey you want to go full around no we got to talk about the right. vacation then we can fool around okay and it's like oh I understand that these two people are married and they're kind of flirting with each other, but also, you know, hey, we're going to go do this thing for the kids. It was the one time in the film I felt like I was watching actual people right. talk to one another. So they kill him immediately. Immediately dead, yes. After Michael Myers kills the dad, he goes inside and kills the mom. He like stabby, stab, stab. And then he holds up a picture of Lori and he's like, oh, oh, oh. and she's like, ah, <laughs> don't. She's uh -huh. dead. Yeah, well, he snaps her neck. Yeah. Put a pause on this movie for a moment. In sure. the original film, it again, it is a uh -huh. tight 90 minutes. It is a straightforward horror film. Michael Myers is in asylum for killing his sister. He escapes. He comes uh -huh. to Haddonfield, his hometown. After he kills a guy to get some overalls, he goes and finds Lori, who's babysitting. And uh, she's got two friends, brunette and a blonde. And mm -hmm. in the movie, Michael Myers kills the blonde and her boyfriend, who are fucking. And then he kills the brunette, who's also babysitting. And then that's it. Like, the whole body count in the original movie is five. Five people die in the mm -hmm. original Halloween. And I think a dog dies. But that's it. Right, because Michael got hungry. 27 people get killed in this movie, Bo. That is one death every five minutes. And there's no suspense. There's no sense of horror. It's just violent, brutal killings. Yeah, all of that is accurate. Yeah, there, there is nothing in this movie that is suspenseful or scary. No. It's just an exercise in... Brutality and violence. Yeah, whether it's the language we're talking about or the violence in the movie, it's just taking everything to an extreme that's incredibly off-putting to me. And I, I feel like I'm such an old man saying that, but... No! Like, I watch plenty of stuff that is extreme and pushing the envelope and that kind of thing and this just doesn't have any there there like there's no reason for it other than the thing itself why is he back in Haddonville I, I, to kill who and I, why I think the idea is he's trying to find the sister that he lost that he actually cared about right okay quick spoilers so baby boo is Laurie okay so that that's what's right. going on but in the original Halloween and Halloween 2 Halloween 2 and the connection with them being brother and sister that was just some bullshit they made up for the sequel like, that wasn't part mm -hmm. of the original. It wasn't part of the planned legacy of Halloween. That's right. And, and it's like, so Michael Myers is back to kill the sister that he loved? Why? Uh, and here's how you fix it. Ready? You don't make him on. love baby boo like, mm, you're the greatest baby boo. You don't suck. You make boo be the child of William Forsyth and the mom. 
Okay. And he's killed everybody. Now he's back to finish the deal because baby boo was there to make things worse than they already oh, are. I right. like that. It's real easy. Just call Bo and I. We can <laughs> fix your movie, people. Yeah. I mean, some. We can't fix every movie, but we we can make Chad it Chad and Bo, we make things less worse. <laughs> Yeah, we should get some cards. <laughs> we we make things less worse. Make six of movies making things less worse than 2019 or 18. Whenever the hell we started this, I, I don't know. yeah, it was pre-pandemic. I know yeah, that. That's much. right. It's, it's pretty much the before times and the after times. <laughs> that's right. Uh, like where there's kids at the end of Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome <laughs> that are like telling the story with the tin cans tied to the wood. Oh, there was the before four times. <laughs> anyway, so. Lori goes to her babysitting gig. At like a midnight or two in the morning or something. And where are all the parents of these kids? Or where are the people on the streets? There are so few extras in this movie. It's crazy. Like there's no one in this movie other than people with speaking What parts. you don't know, Chad, is that they're at the Hocus Pocus uh... party where the witches have all put a spell on them. <laughs> so and that's, a, that's a movie happening elsewhere <laughs> in the film. Over at a second house, Annie is babysitting a little girl. Lori is babysitting Tommy the boy. And they've come up with mm -hmm. this plan where Annie is going to disappear and go have sex with her boyfriend, dumping off the kid she should be babysitting with Lori and Tommy, which that kid's totally terrible telling her parents she got dumped off so her babysitter could go have sex with her boyfriend right yeah and michael myers for some reason is inside the house where annie is babysitting this little girl why why is he in that house Bo? he's not trying to kill either of them well theoretically he's going to kill annie but then get sidetracked by watching the thing which is what Lindsay's watching and what, what he was well, who, watching right. you know as a well, kid that's understandable but why is he killing just annie? for goofs you know fun Right. It's, yeah. it's it's because that's what Michael Myers is do. They just kill yeah. people. And this is that's someone right. in the movie and he's going to kill them. Yeah. All right. I mean, don't try to make sense of this. We just got to get right. through it. And <laughs> so when Annie comes in to collect Lindsay, who's the little girl, like Michael Myers has fucked off somewhere. We don't know where. And then we cut to Loomis, who is trying to tell Sheriff Brad Dourif about Michael Myers showing up in town. He's coming. I tell you, you've got to do everything. And Sheriff Brad Dourif's like, I'm doing nothing. You must do everything. Nothing. Everything. Nothing. So what you're telling me is that this Michael Myers mm. showed up in our town, grabbed his dead sister's tombstone, yes. and just walked away with it like he's some kind of professional wrestler like Big E or the Big Show or maybe The Undertaker. He's very strong. Yes, he's very, very strong. I once saw him pick up a Pepsi machine and shake it violently until a Mountain Dew fell out. He didn't even drink it. He just wanted to see if he could make a Mountain Dew fell out. And he did, because he's so also, strong. Also, he befriended a Native American man. And <laughs> once he, he was given electroshock therapy, that Native American man picked up a water fountain, threw it through a wall, and just walked uh, out. I'm telling you, Sheriff, evil is yeah, here. Yeah. I was I was in that movie. I remember oh, that. That's right. You know what? I'm going to write a book about that. <laughs> and so Sheriff Brad Dourif is like, it sounds like you're talking about the Antichrist I here. I am! I'm going to write a book about that, too. I'm going to write a book about you. I'm going to write a book about me writing a book about you. And I'm going to write a book about you writing a book about me. It's going to be told from third first person. No one's done that before. Take that, Tim Robbins. I mean, Tom Robbins. I'm going to write a book about Tim Robbins being Tom Robbins. I am going to write a screenplay. It's going to be the story of Tom Robbins, but I'm going to make sure that Tim Robbins plays Tom Robbins. Yes. He's going to be delusional and think that he's Christopher Robin with Winnie the Pooh. And I'm going to have Willie Nelson play Winnie the Pooh. And he'll be Willie the Pooh. And he'll smoke marijuana. And he'll run around. And I'll have Dave Chappelle in it. He'll play Tigger. And it'll be very controversial because Dave Chappelle is a black man. And he says controversial things. I'm going to call it Still Life with the Red-Headed Stranger. It's going to be a big <laughs> hit. I don't know what any of this means. I've got a gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course you do. It's Illinois. <laughs> uh, anyway, so Annie walks Lindsay over with a pumpkin and some popcorn. And Lindsay is like, oh, are you going off to fuck your boyfriend, my babysitter? And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Even the kids are in on it in this when movie? When she shows up at the house... Annie and Lori start having a conversation about this cute guy from school named Ben. And this conversation ben involves Traver, Annie yeah. saying, you know, he's retarded, but he's not short bus retarded. And this whole scene ends with Annie dry humping Lori against the wall as the both of them make cartoonish sex noises in front of two elementary school aged children. Yeah, that's right. And also because, again, we can't ever like Lori in this movie. Annie tells her. 
all you need to do is get laid. And instead of Lori saying like, no, no, no. I mean, I, I like Ben, but we're just going to go to the dance or whatever. Just make her like the decent, likable person. She's like, you know what, Annie? You're right. I do need to get yeah, I, by three different guys in three different holes. And it's not the three you're thinking of. <laughs> and so Paul, Annie's boyfriend shows Honk, up. Honk, hey, babe, get in the car. Off, we're going to go have sex. Which Honk, is what Honk. happens. And so they they run off. Sheriff Brad Dourif and Loomis are now in Sheriff Brad Dourif's office. And Sheriff Brad Dourif is like, look, pal, I read your book. And I got to tell you, I think you're nothing but a leech. Mm. I should write a book about that. I know that Michael has come back for his baby sister. His babysitter? No. And, and Brad Durf, then, he, like, he puts two and two together, I guess. Mm, Lisa needs braces. Michael Myers' sister. <laughs> <laughs> Sheriff Brad Durf says, I just realized the plot twist of this movie. I made a promise a few years ago to keep a secret. But if I tell you, you got a pinky promise you won't tell nobody else, okay? Because I won't be your friend no more if you tell anybody. I definitely won't write a book about it. Yes. What about a blog? Uh, all, all right, no blog either. Mm, all right, I'll tell you. Good, because I'm going to do a podcast. <laughs> we cut away to Laurie's house where the phone is ringing and there is blood everywhere. It's all over the place. And the ring, 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 nobody answers the phone because mom and dad are dead there. And we cut back to the babysitting house where Laurie's there with these kids and they're laughing and giggling. That's something else about this movie. It tonally, it's all over the place. Like it'll get real serious and suspenseful or try to. Then it'll cut to two girls dry humping and giggling about short bus retarded kids from their school. It never mm -hmm. allows the movie to slowly build a boil of tension and suspense as soon as things start to get really focused somebody comes in and goes <laughs> and then runs off so tommy is asking Lori about the boogeyman and Lori has come up with this nonsense about like the boogeyman only attacks people who don't believe in the boogeyman so tommy and Lindsay are like wait that doesn't make any sense right because rob zombie wrote this movie you idiots so they just end up tickling her and it's the closest we get other than the parents on the porch the closest we get to like well this is a somewhat wholesome scene but I it guess? doesn't belong in the third act of a horror movie no no no. you no, can no, put no. it in act one to help endear us to this character but that ship sailed we cut to annie right. and her boyfriend having sex i guess in the house that the little girl lives in and then this guy takes his pants off but just down to his knees seems like a real impractical way to have sex on a couch if you ask me and then michael myers just shows up and stabs this guy and bounces him off the wall annie runs out the front door of the house topless with her girls a jiggling and her ass a bouncing and then michael myers just grabs her yanks her back inside and she runs to the kitchen and she grabs her own butcher knife bow but then michael myers just punches her and down she goes yeah he doesn't kill her he just kind of beats the shit out of yeah, her yeah and she's topless and covered in her own blood uh -huh. he drags her into another room she's just screaming and crying and you're like this is torture it doesn't have the over-the-top funhouse macabre craziness of slasher movies it's just like the kind of shit you hear about in a women's shelter <laughs> Yeah, it's just really dark and grim. So we cut back to Sheriff Brad Dourif, who tells us the plot of the you movie. You promise you're not going to tell? I pinky swear. Just, I'm, just, I'm going to turn on this electronic voice recorder to capture all of this so that I can never tell anyone. And they'll never hear it. They might read about it, though. Mm -hmm. Hey, I said no. no books. You didn't say anything about pamphlets. <laughs> oh, uh, stupid pamphlets. So that night, I was somehow at the scene of the crime. 15 years ago and there was a baby boo and i decided that this kid shouldn't have to deal with being the sister of a psychopath so i just took her to a different hospital and threw her out the window at a slow roll yeah. i know what you're thinking how would this michael myers fella know about all this the answer is he wouldn't that's what's known as a plot hole in a movie like this. See, Dr. Loomis in the original Halloween, that detail didn't come up until part two. And even then it felt contrived. But the people behind that movie were looking to capitalize on the surprising success of the original Halloween. Kind of like what we're doing in this movie. Except it sucks. I found out they got adopted by the Strodes just down the road here. But now they're not answering the phone. And I'm starting to think that maybe they're all hacked uh, up. 
And then over the radio, we get like, call not cars, call not cars. UFOs on Michigan Avenue. <laughs> Could get back over to Babysitter House Lane. There's a naked girl screaming covered in blood who looks an awful lot like the sheriff's daughter. We cut to Lori walking Lindsay back to her house, not because her parents are home, just because Lori's kind of done with her. Or yeah, she's something? just going to dump her off there and then call it a night. But instead, they walk into the, the foyer uh -huh. and discover that boyfriend Paul has been hung from the stairs with a pumpkin on his head. And Annie is still alive, gasping and blood bubbling out of her mouth. So Michael Myers took time to string up this dude and then to lean into the festive nature of the holiday, plop a jack-o'-lantern on his head. Like, th they're going to find yes, this hilarious. That's right. This definitely doesn't suck. You know who doesn't suck me? Grown up Michael Myers. <laughs> Lori goes to call an ambulance, and as she does, Michael just steps out from behind the door. You know what doesn't suck? Hiding behind the door. <laughs> and Annie sees him and is trying to warn Lori, but again, is gargling on her own uh -huh. blood and can't quite get it out. So then we see that while Lori is making this report, there's a cutaway scene to Loomis and Sheriff Brad Dourif in the car hearing this call come in over the wire. Yeah. And, you know, Sheriff Brad Dourif is like, you know, who called that in? Lori Strode. Oh, boy. It sure sounds like we stepped in mm -hmm. it. So we cut back to the house. Michael grabs Lori, and then she runs while he's after her. She crashes through a window and gets a bum leg. So she's got this really pronounced limp. And Michael Myers is behind her. Lori's like, help! Help! And somehow she outruns Michael Myers with her busted up leg. She gets back to the house where she was babysitting and she bangs on the door and screams tommy the kid opens the door and the little girl's with him they shut it and they lock it and then michael myers just crashes through the door like oh yeah because that's how serial killers <laughs> do in these movies and then yeah. out of nowhere both two sheriff's deputies show up guns drawn they enter the house and they go to a bathroom door where Lori's hiding with these two kids and they're like hey man open the door we got guns it's cool we're the cops and then she unlocks the door much to the objection of these two kids but before all of this can kind of like come to a safe place michael myers just shows up stabs one of the deputies and explodes through the bathroom door the second deputy shoots michael myers in the shoulder but that doesn't stop him and then he walks over and stabby stab stab kills second deputy let me say, Michael Myers is not a supernatural being. Yes, he's eight and a half feet tall, okay? But he got shot in the shoulder like this at close range. That's taking you down, brother. Unless you're high on PCP and horse tranquilizers, you are going to stop whatever it is you're doing and you are going to fall to the ground. This is silly. Yes. Well, and th that's kind of the question, right? Like even in the original is, how does he keep getting back up? And of course the answer in the original is, well, that was the boogeyman. Whereas in this one... I guess that's the reason. But if you're playing it super realistic, then why do we have him supernaturally able to be invulnerable, to be shot and just kind of shake it? But up? I thought in the first one, he gets shot and his body hits the ground and then they go to look for him and he's gone. And it's more of like, oh, where'd he go? He's just disappeared and it's more mysterious. Dude, in this one, he gets shot. Like, you're not getting up well, from that. Well, but in the original, he also gets, like, stabbed in the neck and the eye and, oh, you know, yeah, like... Oh, yeah, 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 in the, in the closet. Right, but, but again, that's a less realistic movie. And this movie's trying to play it as if, like, well, this is what would really happen. Yeah. And it's like, right, well, if you're going to go that route, he gets shot. <laughs> He's going down, He's brother. He's like, fuck! This sucks! <laughs> right. I got shot. Bullets suck. Yeah. Michael Myers grabs Lori, who just passes out from being overstressed. And then Michael Myers just carries her, you know, like Faye Ray down the street. Do, 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 do. I don't know where they're going. Then Sheriff Brad Dorf, he shows up, goes inside the house and finds his daughter lying on the floor topless covered in blood loomis runs inside and he sees the two kids who just run across the street just screaming like help 
help! Help! <laughs> Loomis decides to do something in the movie for once, and he dashes off into the night. We cut to Laurie, who is now not wearing her glasses, so it's kind of hard to recognize her. It's real darkly lit, and Laurie is in the basement of... Is she in the Myers I, house? I believe that's right. Uh, so I don't know how far away. Earlier, it doesn't matter. It, it's nowhere near where they were. So anyway, she's there, and her friend Linda is still naked and dead, and she's laying on the ground. We see the headstone that was stolen, and it says Myers on it. And there's also a lit jack-o'-lantern, because Michael Myers loves decorating for Halloween. And Lori's there, and she looks at Michael Myers, and she says, like, who are you? What do you want? And Michael Myers kneels down and pulls out a photo, or he pulls out the photo of him as a boy holding baby Boo that his mom gave him at the, the cuckoo bin. And Lori looks at it, and she's all confused. She's like, I don't know these people. Leave me alone. And then Michael Myers drops his knife. He removes his John Carpenter officially licensed brand Michael Myers mask and he kind of drops his head and I'm like I don't know what's going on here at yeah, all I mean is he trying to connect with her some way of like hey I'm your brother but in in the original movie they were going to have him speak here but they wisely were like that sounds stupid but both versions of it, or like whether he talks or doesn't, whether he talks or just shoves a picture in her face, it, they're equally dumb. Laurie just looks at him. She's like, I want to help you. I really do. And she looks over and she sees the knife. She's like, I just, I just, I just got your knife, motherfucker. And then she stabs Michael Myers in the shoulder and like from the top down, like into his body cavity. It's the same shoulder where he was shot. So good luck uh -huh. with that. Laurie escapes to another room, but Michael Myers <laughs> crashes through the walls. Doesn't know how doors work, apparently. Lori <laughs> eventually gets a shot of homegrown adrenaline and she gets out of the house. She falls into an empty backyard swimming pool. And I was like, wait, is this the old Myers household? The white trash one? Because if it is, they had a swimming pool? <laughs> right. That's exactly what I thought. I was like, hey, fancy. Yeah, like, like their kid has a bathroom connected to his bedroom and they had a pool? Like she must have been one hell of a stripper. Man, you clean this house up. You're living in a mansion. Laurie's down in the deep end of this pool and she's laying on a bed of fallen leaves. She's screaming for help. And then Michael Myers, he marches down in the pool and Dr. Loomis shows up and he says, Michael. Michael, it's me, Samuel, your best friend, buddies for life. The one a book about you? Three books, you actually. I sent you the signed copy because we're friends and I didn't even charge you for it. Well, I charged you for the book, but not the signature. And that's what's important. <laughs> Dr. Loomis pulls uh, out his gun and he fires not one, not two, but three shots in the back of Michael Myers, which drops him flat on his belly. And then Dr. Loomis escorts Lori out of this abandoned swimming pool, leaving Michael Myers in the leaves, just bleeding out. He now has four uh -huh. gunshots in his body and a knife stab wound that's easily 12 to 14 inches from his neck into his lung. Loomis is like, well, come with me, Lori Strode, did you know that you're the sister of a maniac? I'll tell you all about it. Actually, I'll write the book and then I'll give you a copy of the book. This time it, I'm going to charge, though. I've learned my lesson with that guy down there that I shot. <laughs> this is the point where she says, well, was that the boogeyman? Yes, I believe oh, it was. Oh, that's a wonderful title. Was that the boogeyman? The sequel, yes, it was the boogeyman. The Devil's Eyes Part 2. Was that the boogeyman? The Devil's Eyes Part Love 3. It. I'm your boogeyman. Do what I can. <laughs> huh. I wonder if Casey or the Sunshine Band might get pissed. You know what? I'm going to give them writing credit, but give them no money. I'm going to lawyer it up. That's what I'm going to do. M <laughs> Michael Myers busts in through Laurie Strode's the window in, in the police cruiser, yeah. drags her away. Loomis chases after her, and he, Loomis is like, I failed you, Michael. It's my fault. And so Michael just grabs him by the head and starts squeezing. Is he putting his thumbs in his eyes or just smushing them together so blood comes out of his nose or something? And then Laurie runs upstairs into the abandoned Myers household. She's just screaming and crying. She crawls through this small hole and into the walls of this home. And much like Friday the 13th and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remakes, she finds herself in this concealed dark tunnel where she covers her own mouth with her hand to prevent herself from screaming. I don't know if that works or not i'll try it the next time somebody's trying to murder me and then we cut to michael myers just dragging dr loomis through the house i guess he's dead now who knows who cares speaking of the richie riches living in this fancy house not only do they have a pool they have crawl spaces between the walls chad well that's where the cordless vacuum system goes you just plug it in and your room's magically clean it's just crazy man like 
it would have been nice to kind of set up the geography of all of this. If you're going to take the time to show Michael as a sure. kid, why not set up where everything in this house yeah. is? So once Lori's in there, you got a sense of place like home alone. And she doesn't know where she's going, but Michael does because he knows the geography. Oh, of the that's place. good. And then, right. <laughs> we make your movies less worse. <laughs> but th that would actually create tension where we as the audience know something she doesn't. And so she could be moving to somewhere in the house and we're like, oh, well, he knows a way to like cut her off. Or, or that that's a dead end and she's about to yeah. get screwed over. Yeah. So Michael Myers, he starts smashing through the walls of this house like he's auditioning for his own HGTV makeover show. And Laurie, she's up in the ceiling and she's crawling around. And then Dr. Loomis, he's on the floor and the gun that he had earlier is beside him. All of this is important, but not really. Laurie runs over and grabs the gun and then she hustles her way up into this attic crawl space. And Michael Myers, he grabs a board and starts just plunging holes into the ceiling the same way that Jason Voorhees was using his machine up through the floorboard to stab that guy in his hands eventually michael myers smashes the ceiling so much that it's un unstable and laurie just falls down to the floor below and she's got the gun in her hand she stands up and michael myers just gives her the bums rush crashes into her they fall <laughs> off a balcony onto the ground below laurie climbs to her knees picks up the gun points it at michael myers heads and pulls the trigger not once not twice but thrice and no bullets come out because right, apparently Loomis was playing Russian roulette earlier or somehow the chamber of the gun spun or something. I don't know. She ends up giving the gun the old college try and aims it at Michael Myers head, pulls the trigger. Once again, the gun goes off and there is an explosion of blood backward onto her face. That is, it's unbelievable how much yeah. blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, right. It's a real Gallagher spray of blood. <laughs> it's like. It, in Raising Arizona, when that blue ink bomb goes off, when Gail and what's his name? E Ebel? Evel and e Gail. E Ebel? After they rob the hayseeds. Uh -huh. it, I mean, it's just boom and blood is everywhere which made me question how in the hell did they make a sequel to this movie i haven't seen oh, it by Chad. the way but i'm like she just shot this dude in the head so violently that his brains blew out both forward and backward at the same that's time. right oh uh, we'll get to it at some point chad and then she screams and then we uh -huh. get in credits with the Halloween theme and old timey eight millimeter footage intercut with some credits that I didn't pay attention right. to. And it, the whole movie is like Michael cracking open a plastic horse, I guess, to allude to the fact that he hurt animals as a kid, question mark, I whatever. I Ugh. This movie is awful. I don't know if the listeners have picked up on the fact that neither of us like this movie even a little bit. Well, I don't even know I'm going to be able to rank these movies this season. <laughs> I'm not. I, I say that without a, an ounce of, of hyperbole. Like, I, I really don't, I don't know. know. Like, I feel like, oh, man, you're right. No, I was going to try to, like, make a case for something like the texas chainsaw massacre but that's terrible the nightmare remake all right and we're not done look we're not finished look, yet right, so we look, look, here's what we can, just... here's what we can say we yes. are technically past halloween we're put halloween's that's in the right. rearview mirror by the time this uh -huh. episode comes out hopefully thanksgiving is in the rearview mirror uh -huh. which means we're rounding the corner to christmas and for the season finale of season 22's theme deja vu i want to toss in a movie that at its heart is the story of a parent giving their child the gift they've always wanted. And no, we're not talking about Jingle All the Way. We're talking, we already did that in season three. We're talking about the remake of Child's Play where a doll comes to life, sort of, and then kills a bunch of people at Christmas time, you know, for the yeah. kids. And we're kind of swapping out, like Brad Dourif did the original voice of Chucky. This time around, it is none other than Luke Skywalker himself, Mark Hamill. Oh, I thought you meant the other Luke Skywalker. The rapper. Yeah. Yeah, from Two Love mm -hmm. Crew. A guy I used to work with in a kitchen told me he saw them live once, I think in Daytona or Fort Lauderdale, and that he said he uh -huh. saw him uh, have sex with a woman on stage. That feels yeah. right. 
I hope that happens in the Child's Play remake. I'm pretty sure it doesn't, but <laughs> Aubrey Plaza from The Office is Yeah, that, the voice of Grumpy yeah, Cat. That's right. That's right. Not since Grumpy Cat. Oh, boy. Those were the days. I'll tell you what. Watching Rob Zombie's Halloween makes me long for the days of Grumpy doesn't Cat. Doesn't it, though? Yeah. Like, that movie's terrible, but at least it's not offensively I terrible. I agree with that. Well, there you go. So come back and see us in two weeks' time. Between now and then, you can like, rate, review, tell a friend, share the people with the podcast. When you'll be like, hey, what do you do when you're not doing stuff and things? And you're like, hey, I listen to Big Six Movies. You should listen to it too. It's these two guys and a whole bunch of interns and a bunch of other people who work on this thing that don't really get paid a whole lot of money. That's what I do for fun. You should do it too. And then we appreciate it, kind of, sort of. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on the Rob Zombie remake of Halloween? I've just copyrighted. I make movies less worse. No backsies. Son of you a bitch. You can't even make a pamphlet. We'll see you in two weeks' time, everyone.